What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Plate Coverage. This is a new uh, podcast that the commission and I are going to start. Uh, today, we're going to take a deep dive into the American League, uh, provide our thoughts, predictions type of stuff, who we like in the standings, who we don't like in the standings. Um, and then also in the next couple of days, we'll take a look at the National League as well. Um, after that, we'll be coming to you once a week doing essentially baseball and betting. Anything that has to do with baseball and betting, whether it be players, teams, stories, anything like that. Uh, we're just here to talk about baseball and betting. So, uh, We'll get into it right now with the uh, American League East. Kamish, how are you doing? Doing good, man. I'm excited. You're one of my yeah. favorite people to talk baseball with, and now we get to do it on a weekly basis. I could not be more excited. Yeah, this is awesome, awesome. The excitement for baseball is in the air. So many people that I haven't even know, know love baseball is in the air loving it. So I'm so excited for it to come through. Yeah, and you know, I'm even more excited because we both like an underdog to win the American League East. <laughs> very very true absolutely and we also don't like one of the teams that everybody seems to like with those pinstripes on their jerseys so <laughs> yeah so american league east we both like the the, the tampa bay rays why don't you tell the tell the people why what why we like them a little bit or why you like them a little bit and we can dig in yeah, so for the Rays, it's just one of those things where they have everything that I could possibly want. Um, they have hitting, they have pitching, and they have history that knowing that it's going to work for them. Um, first and foremost with the Rays, you got to look at the pitching staff. And obviously, you can start with Zach Eflin, who obviously is coming over after his, his second year in this contract. Um, and I think that even being even more comfortable here in Tampa Bay, um, he's going to have a very, very solid season. Um, I know that a lot of people, um, including yourself, like him as a dark horse Cy Young candidate. Um, that's how good Zach Leffen is. I know that he's not one of those names that a lot of people uh, talk about as far as the top end pitchers in this league, but Zach Leffen, um is a very, very start, good starter. Um, I wouldn't call him like one of the top aces in the league, um, but I think that he's a lot better than people want to talk about. About. Um, Savali um, is another guy that I think is a little bit underrated. Um, and then they have another, a couple other guys like Alexander and Pepio as well. Um, the bullpen is another thing where it's you have Fairbanks, Adam, and Pache, and then they actually got Phil Maton uh, from the Astros. But it for me with the Rays bullpen, it doesn't really matter because they're going to have five or six guys with a sub three ERA that we've never even heard of. Um, and they're going to be, and then they're going to pitch well all year. Um, and then as far as the bats are concerned, you have a guy in Yanni Diaz that not only hits for average at the top of the lineup, he he can ha he hit for power. Brandon Lowe, Randy Rosarina, Harold Ramirez, Is Isak Paredes, all these guys with power. And then at the bottom of the lineup, you have a guy like Jose Siri who – is a gold glove type of center fielder. I don't I think he has a gold glove yet, but he has that type of caliber. And he's got a whole bunch of power and speed. Um, so, yeah, there's just a lot of things to like about this Rays team. I completely agree with you, man. I, I bet Zach Eflin 250 to 1 to win the Cy Young last year. And for somehow, I mean, I know how. Is it media bias, right? But he didn't get in the into the Cy Young finalist conversation. But I agree with you. He's that good. Aaron Savale, I think, is a very, very interesting arm going into this upcoming season i'll pull up here uh last year obviously he started the season with the guardians they take him over or they tra they trade him over to the rays and what ends up happening is you start to see a little bit of a different pitch mix for aaron savali so you can see against righties end of the season here you got a lot more sliders and then against lefties pretty much got rid of this awful awful fastball uh that that had plagued him th throughout the early part of his career he's always been a relatively high floor guy all of a sudden, last year he goes to he goes to Tampa and he's striking out a bunch of dudes. I mean, damn near thirty percent of guys uh, after after the trade deadline last season. So he's someone that I'm really high on. Ryan Pepio, another one. I mean, you don't trade Tyler Glass now if you don't think you're getting a quality starter back. I think at a certain point you just have to trust that the Rays know what they're doing. People thought, really, Zach Eflin, you're going to give the richest contract in in franchise history to to Zach Eflin for a starting pitcher. And then we all saw what he did last year. So I really, really like the top three with, with Eflin, Savale, and and Pepio. And then I know Taj Bradley's hurt to start the year. Might honestly not be the yeah. worst thing because he's, he's not going to have to throw as many innings. Gets a little bit of a delayed start, less expectations. And then we just, we've just we seen Drew Rasmussen, Jeffrey Springs, Zach Littells, all of these guys who you you might not know them before the season starts, but you're probably going to know. If, if you're into baseball, you're going to know who they are by the All-Star break, and they're probably going to be pretty good. So the Rays for me are just a, a very, very high floor team. And I think every single year they're incredibly undervalued on the betting market. I think they're undervalued in, in, in the public's mind. So I'm excited to watch this team go to work. 
Yeah, and I think just one other thing with the Rays, I think it's really easy to step back and look and talk, look and see how much they've lost, whether it be Franco or Glass now um, or um, Sugar Shane. I mean, there's a lot of things. Luke Rayleigh, um, there's a lot of things that have reasons to not like this race team but all i can tell you guys is, is they've been doing this for five straight years now um and it doesn't really matter who they lose uh they won 99 games last year um it, it's just a team that's an absolute wagon and until they give us a reason otherwise not to trust them i'm going to continue to keep betting overs with this team yep no i completely agree i there's there's tons of offense here even without wonder franco there there's we got guys coming out of the minor league some of these top end prospects that have been coming through their system the curtis meads the uh the junior Camineros, the the uh the josh low i know he's he's hard to start the season but they have some nice guys coming back shane boz and the rotation might be coming back there's there's just a lot of depth for and for this team and speaking of that depth as far as pitching wise carson williams mason montgomery Braden taylor all some of their top prospects as well right under that meat and Caminero yep. level uh that could see it at any time we never know with this race team but they'll probably be very good as well <laughs> yep i completely agree but why don't you tell the the people about uh, i guess our one big dis I, I guess you could call it a disagreement with we're, we're pretty aligned for most of the american league but you got the toronto blue jays up here finishing second in the division i'm a little bit less optimistic about their chances this season so i i will talk about the jays I, the one thing i want to say is that i have them behind a team like the orioles because i just i feel like the jays window is right now and i think that they're going to be one of those teams that maybe going through the year will add more um or maybe willing to take on some more money and whatnot um because i mean just not too long ago if we remember like the Jays almost had Shohei or Otani, Otani, like unless we thought that's what they were. Um, but I still think that this Jays team has one of the best rotations in this um, in this uh, in the American League, at least at least in the American League East. Um, Galsman is one of these guys that continues to show that he is an uh, a absolute stud. He doesn't really get run support at home, um, but always been really good. Chris Bassett, and Jose Barrios, obviously you can. Let's just say that there are times that they don't pitch well, but there's also times that they look very, very good. Um, and I think that Jose Barrios is one of those guys where I think that he's going to start trying to turn, start to turn it on this season. Um, there's a lot of things towards the end of the last year that really made me like Barrios. Grant Bassett seemed to really pitch well in Toronto as well. And then they have a guy like Kikuchi that I think that continues to pitch well at times. Obviously, he's had his ups and downs, but I think with you giving that four, considering what else that you were looking at in the division, uh, Toronto has a, a very good start to what you would need is a good pitching staff that bullpen also has a lot of good guys as well um and then as far as the bats are concerned um if they they need to have steady steady production there's no question from Manoa I'm sorry not Manoa uh Vladimir <laughs> Guerrero Manoa is their fifth starter by the way I didn't even want to talk about that didn't want to talk about him he's not worth the time um but need constant production from Vladimir Guerrero he's pretty up and down last year um it wasn't a terrible year last year for him but um he definitely wasn't the Vladimir Guerrero that we thought he was. He's been working out all spring and summer. Uh, so our winner, he should be back and ready to be the Vladimir Guerrero that we thought he would be, um, which is a reason I mentioned that is because last year he was, Vladimir Guerrero was the 12th most valuable player on the Toronto Blue Jays roster. You just really can't have that from a guy uh, like Vlad Guerrero. Bo Bichette, obviously, as a dark horse MVP candidate every single year, I think one of the better hitters in this league. Uh, defense, not really there with that guy, which bothers me. Uh, but other good hitters that, again, the defense does worry about me. Uh, but Kirk, another solid hitter, George Springer, Darton Valsho, all those guys. Um, I think signing Daniel Vogelbach is going to be decent. And then I think having that veteran uh, in the lineup with Justin Turner. Turner is really, really huge. Also getting Joey Votto, I think, is really nice for them. Um, like I said, I don't worry about their pitching and their bullpen. I, it's more about their bats for me and if they can stay consistent. But like I said, I think that the window for the Blue Jays is essentially closing in this next year or so. Um, and so I'm I'm banking on that if they're not good, they're willing to take on money or send prospects to get better players to be well. So that's why I have them number two in the East. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think this is this is their their last year of are we gonna are we gonna be something and after this year if they once again have an early round playoff exit do we keep Vlad do we keep Bichette like who is our new core because these guys aren't young anymore you we've already they've already signed Bichette to a mini extension but he's coming back up on free agency yeah. Vlad's coming back up on free agency guys like Chris Bassett don't really have skill sets that age very well Gausman they've gotten a lot out of yeah if, if, if it doesn't really, and Springer's getting towards the end of his deal, he's not getting any younger. If it doesn't work out this year, 
it's going to be interesting. And, and I will say, so you got them finishing second. I have them finishing fourth in this division. I think you gave a bunch of good reasons why they could finish second. And I don't think that would be the craziest thing in the world, but from the regression side of things, there's also some reasons to, to be a little bit more cautious with projections with them. So th this chart that you can see here, this is game started by a team's optimal five starters last year. So if you just take the, the five guys who made the most starts for each team last year, the Blue Jays, 147 of their 162 games were started by their top five. The, the four guys that you already mentioned toast include uh, Gausman, Barrios, Kikuchi, and, and Chris Bassett. So 147 games, a lot of them started by those four. Injury luck is one of those things that is a little bit more random, a little bit more unpredictable year to year. So I look at this more as a luck metric. Are they going to get 147 starts from five guys again? I don't know. We've we've seen Gosman already banged up in spring training. It doesn't look all that serious right now. I think this is a little bit of a concern. You mentioned a guy like Justin Turner. I love what Justin Turner brings intangibly to the clubhouse. I think he really benefited from playing in Boston last year. And guys like him, like we just haven't seen a whole lot of guys have super productive years at his age. Going to a really pitcher friendly ballpark now that they changed the dimensions at the Rogers Center. I don't know if he's good because you got to remember they lost Brandon Belt. So even if you think Justin Turner is a good asset, if you I, personally, I don't think he's as good as Brandon Belt was. So you're losing there. Uh, the infield defense, I think, is going to be outstanding outside of Boba Shett. Mm -hmm. The outfield defense is phenomenal. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is like who's going to hit. And, and yeah. what happens if guys like George Springer aren't healthy? Because last year, Springer played 154 games, most in almost a decade. You had Kiermaier actually played the most games since, I think, 2017 out in center field. Varsha was healthy. Uh, Vlad, I know, was a little banged up. Bichette was on the IL a couple of times. But, like, by and large, that team was pretty healthy last year. They still didn't have an elite offense. Now, this year, you're running out guys like Isaiah Connor falefa because you didn't bring Matt Chapman back. You don't have Brandon Belt back at DH. It, it's it's going to be interesting to see what this team – looks like I, i'm with you i think when the pitching's healthy the pitching is no concern whatsoever but for me the bats and then just some of the the larger things that are out of their control that you might you can probably make a strong argument that they're due for some expected regression give me a little bit of pause with them i i will say too i did this before galsman was dealing with a shoulder issue uh, so I, it's not a hill that I'm going to definitely die on, but I'm going to stick to my guns here because I, like I said, I do think that they're going to add a little bit um, if, if things co push comes to shove. But yeah, I, I agree with you. There's some definitely some stark things in regression coming. So that could be a definite worry. There's no doubt about that. We shall see. That's why they play the games, right? It's fun to talk yeah. about this stuff I mean, in, in March. Yeah, it but... is baseball. Crazier <laughs> things could happen. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, of crazy things, oops, wrong screen right there. Apologize everybody. But uh Speaking of, of some teams that could potentially fall apart, we have, uh, I think, similar projections with the Yankees. I have them third. You have them fourth in the division. They're currently favored to win the division. So why don't you give them some insight into why you're not expecting the a 95th percentile outcome for their 2024 <laughs> season? It's just for me, when you take a look at the Yankees, I just don't know what you're really going to get. It's one of the older rosters in the, in the league. Uh, you already like, first of all, you already have DJ LeMay, you hurt. Now you have Garrett Cole hurt, which we don't know when he's going to come back. And so now it's, if you take a look at that Yankees rotation, you're looking at Nestor Cortez, who has a flash in the pan at one point. I, I mean, do you really, can you really bank on him having a fantastic year this year? I know I can't. Um, so I'm not saying that he's going to be terrible. Uh, but I mean, to think that he's going to go out there and have like a sub three, five ERA is I think is a little bit crazy to me. I think that you're going to get him for 20 to 25 games and he's probably going to have like an ERA in the fours. Um, and the same goes for Carlos Rendon. Like not only has Carlos Rendon not really been good in, last year for the Yankees, obviously he was hurt, but remember he was supposed to come into spring this year. He was supposed to be ready to go, all that stuff. Um, and he's been getting lit up in spring. Now I don't put very much stock into what's going on in spring training at all. So the fact that he's gotten lit up doesn't really bother me too much, but it also does show me that they're, they're at no point have I seen with my eyes him dominate a, um, a bat, batting, anybody batting against him. So I, I just have to let my eyes see that before I can yeah. even trust that, regardless well, of what that, the numbers tell me. And I think on that note too, it's, I, I think it's an important distinction to make for people as well, because I'm the same way. Like I don't put a ton of stock into spring training outcome numbers, 
But when a guy's velo is way down and he's coming off of an injury, that's the kind of stuff that stands out to me because guys aren't going out there trying to throw 92 miles an hour. Guys aren't going out there trying not to have good command, right? I, like, I, There's always examples of guys who are just like, oh, I'm just trying to locate my fastball in spring. So they're giving up a ton of hard contact, a ton of runs, and people panic. To me, that's not a, a big concern. But if you can't throw strikes, if your velo's down, if you're if you're just clearly frustrated on the mound, if you're giving up four home runs to on, on backfields to guys who might not even make major <laughs> yes. league rosters, that's the kind of stuff that I think is worth paying a little bit of attention to, especially when you look at a guy like Rendon. I like I, I think you characterize it pretty perfectly. He's a, he has this reputation now as an ace, I guess you could say, but yeah. he's really only had the two good seasons. He had one good yeah, season really, in Chicago, yeah. one in San Francisco. He's he doesn't get a lot of ground balls. So if the velo goes down and the strikeout rate goes down, that's a lot of hard contact, right? Line drives, fly balls. He plays in a little league stadium in Yankee stadium. And then you said like last year he came back. I know he had the injuries, but he was really, really bad. Like there's guys like Kershaw and other skill sets that age a little bit more gracefully because they can get weak contact because they can get ground balls. If Radon doesn't have the ability to get strikeouts, if he can't get swings and misses the way he did in 2021 and 2022, this is just objectively a really bad starter for the New York Yankees. And, and Garrett Cole's out for at least half the season. He's probably going to go on the 60 day IL. I was going to say, I think he's going to be on the 60, if not longer. Uh, yeah. The only, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but just because it's not torn doesn't mean that he's not going to be out for a long time. I mean, yeah, that's your, I that's your number one guy in your organization. You're not going to take yeah. any chances with Garrett Cole. So, yeah, I um, completely agree. And then if you go and take a look at the bullpen, I mean, do we really trust this bullpen that consists of guys like Clay Holmes, Johnny Lasagna, Ian Hamilton, Caleb Ferguson? I mean, all those guys have certain things that you can like about them. But I mean, at no point was Clay Holmes like this lockdown guy last year. I mean, he had his couple of weeks here and there, but overall, um, I'm just not really seeing it with that bullpen. And then if you get up into the lineup, um, it's a lot of guys that I don't know if I trust. I mean, do do I? What am I going to get from Anthony Rizzo? I understand that he was hurt last year. I, I get that. Um, but can we? I mean, he's another one of those guys we just talked about. It gets harder and harder to produce as you get older in age. He's one of those guys. John Carlos Stanton can barely even run around the bases at times. I mean, <laughs> did lose ten pounds. Of, he's in the outfield this spring. We'll see. We'll see yeah, what happens so it's there. Just, you go up and down the lineup. I mean, do I expect Soto to hit well? Absolutely, in, in that stadium. There's no question about that. But one. Soto I can also tell you that if Juan Soto starts if it's like two on one out and he takes a walk to load the bases and then somebody and then judge flies out and then Rizzo flies out the New York fans are going to hate Juan Soto like this whole walking thing and stuff like that I, I mean I, the fans could turn on him in an instant um, I'm not saying that that's going to happen I'm just saying there's a lot of ways that I think that this team could not really go the way people think they do I don't really like the fact that Glaber Torres is going to be your leadoff man now um, I think DJ Le Mayhew would be really, really, really important to that team at the top of the lineup if he's healthy. He just hasn't been healthy lately. Um, Volpe, Trevino, all the, those guys at the bottom of the lineup, I'm really not there. So I, I, I honestly, I'm not a Yankees hater, but I just don't see it in any way, shape, or form with this team. So I'm a little bit different. I'm like I gut situational type of person. Commission is going to give you everything that you need to know about Velo and all that stuff. So he can talk about that a little bit more. But my eyes, my gut, and what I'm seeing, there's no way in hell this Yankee team is that good. No, I, I agree with you. Um, I bet them under 94 and a half wins. I think they're already down to 91 and a half or 90 and a half. Yeah, they are. I think the biggest thing with them is their their peak is undeniable, right? You have Aaron Judge right. and Juan Soto in the lineup. With if Anthony Rizzo was healthy, if Giancarlo losing 10 pounds and he's actually moving better. Of course. I mean, like those are four guys right there on top of a very good hitter in Glaber Torres. That's five really good guys in the lineup. And that's before mentioning like Jason Dominguez potentially coming back and some other key bats. I think the biggest thing for me is, and we talked a little bit about it pre-show from a betting perspective, if you're betting a team to win over 90 games, or you're betting a team in a tough division to, to win that division, especially the Yankees aren't at long odds. I mean, it, it, that's not a, a very fruitful outcome. Uh, I think they're at like plus 165 right now. If you go hitter by hitter in this lineup. Soto, I think, is probably the only one that is immune from any critique at the plate. I, I wish he would swing more often, but he's going to hit 35 home runs. He's going to be on base. You have a thought. He's immune from anything at the plate as far as us, but if you're a Yankees fan and you're getting Very ready true. to pay him all yeah. this money and you guys aren't doing well and he's walking, I mean, that's not going to be okay with you. Yeah. I'm just saying. And and he, I mean, he's, in my opinion, way too patient at the plate. Yes. I, I think there's, there's good plate discipline and then there's just being too passive. 
And Juan Soto last year, I'll pull up his uh I'll, I'll pull up his numbers right here for, for his plate discipline metrics. Really, I mean, it's honestly just it, it's worrisome in some respect. I know he's going into the final year of his contract here, but the fact that he is so so patient at the it's plate. It's almost think- like he's too good. Like when I say that, like he can see it so well and he knows what a ball and a strike is, but at the same time, like it doesn't work, it doesn't matter yeah. at times because the umpire isn't going to give him that call, even if it is off the plate. And he he doesn't take it in his head, okay. I'm not getting this call off the plate today, so I gotta defend. He doesn't do that. Yeah. He will take it and was take it every single time because he's so disciplined. But yeah. I think that that can also be a negative at times as well. Yeah, 100% agree. And this is like, so this is, you can see based on areas of the zone last year, what was his swing percentage? You can see these gray bars right here, the league average. So does a really good job not swinging at pitches on the edge of the zone, which are which are difficult to make quality contact against. And then of course, you don't want to chase bad pitches that are really far out of the zone. That's, you see guys that have high strikeout rates and things like that. So, so does a really good job not swinging at those pitches. My biggest problem with him is he also doesn't swing very often at pitches that are in the dead heart middle of the plate. Like when you're talking middle, middle fastballs, how much, I mean, you, you're a Padres fan. You watch him how much last year, zero, zero count cut pitchers feel comfortable laying in a meatball oh, on yeah. counts against him. And then he's behind in the count. Soto was a very good hitter, but I think he has a problematic approach at the plate. Uh, tr- truthfully, I do. I think he needs to be more aggressive. And then uh, we can start with him. The base running is atrocious. Oh my god! The defense is that, an extreme yeah. liability with Juan Soto. So he, there's, you could poke holes at him. You can go all the way down this lineup. So we got first base Rizzo coming off of a major concussion, right? You have Glaber Torres, pretty solid hitter going into a contract year, which is always good at the plate, but he can't play defense. Then you got. And I don't even know if I like him at the top of the lineup. Like I like, I would want him a little bit lower personally, but maybe that's just a preference thing. I. Th- I, I like I think whether you want him first or somewhere else in the lineup, I think at the end of the day, like he's not a he's not a superstar, right? He's not yeah, Aaron okay, Judge yeah. that lead off. So I, like I think we're fine there. LeMayhew already banged up, showing some real signs of age related decline. Volpe, I I'm higher on this kid long term than I think some people, but he really didn't show us any reason to be optimistic about his bat last year. Uh, he didn't walk, especially after the first month of the season. Like he just he was a horrible horrible hitter. Six sixty six OPS for the season. Juan Soto, we talked about him. Aaron Judge, I love Aaron Judge. I don't know how you feel about Judge. Yeah. I think he's undeniably one of the three best hitters in baseball. But the problem is he 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 hasn't been on the field consistently throughout his career. And then they're projecting him to be in center field a bunch this year. After he hurt his toe last year at Dodger Stadium, he did not play center field once the rest of the season. And now you have Soto cannot play center field. Verdugo cannot play center field. Stanton cannot play center field. I know you got Grisham, but Grisham's not a bat you want in the lineup every day. No, so you're going to be have, there's sacrifices that are going to be made with this team in one respect or another. And you mentioned Holmes and Hamilton and and Loisaga in the bullpen, and I mean we're definitely on the same wavelength there. Holmes goes through these stretches of dominance, and then God, like we're sending him out to the ninth inning again. You're you're you you just feel it's like it's inevitable that you're going to lose the game at that point. And then Hamilton, you know, we just haven't seen a long track record from him. Loisaga's got a couple of Tommy John surgeries and he's dealt with some elbow inflammation. Conley's never healthy in the bullpen. I was just about to say those three names, Efros, Conley and Trevino all yeah. hurt again and they never seem to be healthy. So, so I, I, I think the Yankees, I would just, I know psychologically they're kind of like the chiefs in football. They're kind of like, you know, the old warriors in the NBA where like it feels sacrilegious to bet against them because it just feels like they have all this talent and all these big names, but they're just not, that great of a baseball team in my mind. We'll see, but I I can see them scoring runs. My issue is what are we going to get? Like he talked about the base running. I mean, me and him, me and Kamish talked about Soto for like 25 minutes the other <laughs> night about the bad, the bad thing, the goods, but you can just see like, if it's going to be seventh, eighth and ninth inning, and these guys have to make a good base running decision or a good play in the outfield mm-hmm. or hit a cutoff man or something like that. Those are the little things that I don't feel like this team is going to do. And that's going to end up building and killing them later on down the season. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, what about the other two teams in the division? So we got the Orioles we haven't talked about yet, which feel like everybody's media darling. And then we have the Red Sox, which seem like the, the forgotten team in a, in a really competitive division. Uh, what are your thoughts? We'll start with the Orioles and then we'll go to the Red Sox. Yeah, so with Baltimore, I think 
I, I don't, I'm not trying to make a case that they're not going to be good. Um, I did play their season win total under, I think it was 91 and a half or, uh, or 90 and a half. Um, and, and here's why. Um, do I think that that lineup is awesome with Mullins, Rushman, uh, Gunnar Henderson, Santander, Ryan O'Hearn, Ryan Mountcastle? I mean, all those guys, Those it's very good. I also want to say that they made a right, the, the correct decision in not having Jackson Holiday on this roster. Like, I know a lot of people on Twitter are like, oh my God, how can you not have him on the roster? For that kid and his development, that is the 100,000% the right decision from that team. I don't know how you feel about that, Kamish, but that's I how I completely agree, man. That. He played 36 okay. games at AAA last year. He's 20 okay, years cool. old. We, we can wait a few weeks, maybe a yeah. month, to make sure he, he feels confident that it's not cold when he gets to Baltimore and then everybody's riding because he's not batting 300. Give him a little bit. I, I think well, and not to game. mention like who are you, you, I, it's just like the all-star, like all-star games, like who are you going to sit to put him yeah. in the lineup? I mean, that's who you're going to take off. Yeah. So, and if you can't play him every day, like, like, What's let's say you're point? not going to play him against lefties, then you're stunting his development. Then he's not getting yeah. every day at bat. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. You're taking a whole bunch of at bats away from this kid. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there because this is a baseball all inclusive show. So this is the whole point of this is trying to talk as much baseball as possible. Uh, so yeah, their batting is very good. I'm not there with the pitching. Um, do I think that Corbin birds is going to be decent? Yeah. Um, but I I'm not uh, the biggest Corbin Burns guy. Um, I do think that he's one of the better pitchers in the league, but as far as an ace of the staff, um, I, I'm just really not, I don't think he's one of the higher end aces. That's just me. That's just my personal opinion. I think that playing in Milwaukee is going to be a lot different than playing in the AL East on a daily basis. Uh, Grayson Rod Rodriguez stud. Um, I think that he's going to be a star. I think he could be a dark horse Cy Young candidate. I really do. Uh, but as far as Wells, Kramer, and Urban, I don't really know what to expect from these guys. I know that they all pitched really well last year, and there's a lot of positive things to look at them. But I honestly think that they could all have four, three ERAs or higher. And if that's the case, then you're going to be asking that bullpen that's going to be asking a lot um, because Cano, I don't think Cano is going to close. I understand they have Kimbrell, but I don't think he, he really likes closing. Um, I think that he likes his role in that seven in that eighth inning. Um, and I don't really trust Kimbrell on a, on a daily basis, let alone at all. Um, and then, Columbo or Columbo is what I like to call him. Tate, Perez, Webb, all those guys. I just think that are average arms that pitched really well last year when it was on a very big high. Um, I think there's a lot of good things to think about this Orioles team, but in general this year, I'm just not as high as everybody else. I'm not trying to say that they're going to miss the playoffs. I just don't think that they're as good as everybody thinks they are. And there's other negative things to point out, like how young they are, how weak the pitching staff can be at times. Cause if one of those guys goes down, that means that makes it even more weaker in my, in my eyes. So um, I'm just, again, do I think that they're going to be in the playoffs? Yes. I just don't think that they're just this, some machine that everybody, like he pointed out the media darlings. Yeah. I'm just not there with them yet. I'm not bold enough to say that they're going to miss the playoffs either, but if there was one team that I could see going from 100 wins to yes. missing the playoffs, it's the Orioles in a, in a few it reasons. I, one for If you guys know me, I would love to come on this show and tell you that the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles are missing the playoffs. I would love to, Atlanta Braves fans, just so like I told you guys, is your guys' fate last year, but I can't do it just yet. But <laughs> just hold on. Go ahead. Go. So I think I think the pitching staff for me is the, the most notable point to touch on because obviously Corbin Burns was this this huge offseason addition one thing about Corbin Burns is the velo has been down you can see I'll blow this up so you can see the velo is down a little bit and it might not seem like a huge deal but for a guy like Corbin Burns who doesn't throw a lot of first pitch strikes the fact that he's no longer an elite strikeout pitcher assuming that, that velo doesn't come back last year there was 23 starters that threw at least 100 innings that struck out fewer than 26 percent of the guys they faced and had less than a 60% first pitch strike ratio. And you can see none of them were none of them were excellent. You, you have a lot of three eights, fours in the XERA. Uh, so league average FIP, FIP, which is a more predictive way of evaluating pitchers than just basic ERA, which pitchers don't always have a lot of control over. You can see he's in a, he's in a class with some of these guys, like an aging Justin Verlander, Patrick Sandoval's, Jack Flaherty's, Christian Javier, who struggled a lot last year. Like these are not very impressive names. So if you put them into this classification of not getting ahead, not being able to strike out a bunch of guys, the big ballpark in Baltimore at, at Camden certainly is going going to help him a little bit, especially at home. But it's not like I don't think you're. I know he's the favorite to win the American League Cy Young right now. I think that's a huge mistake. Like if there's one guy that I would absolutely advise you do not bet this no guy way. at his current price, it's Corbin Burns. And then I'm yeah. And then Bradish is out probably for at least a month or two and. And we saw what Tony Gonsolin happened to him last year when he tried to pitch through a torn UCL. 
And now we got Bradish probably trying to do the same thing. That's not really inspiring. I really like Rodriguez. Uh, Grayson's going to be great. I agree with you. But Dean Kremer, as a general rule, guys, and again, we're just going to talk all things baseball. So some things are related to betting more than others. But as a general rule, when you're evaluating pitchers, if a guy strikes out less than 20% of the guys that he faces and he doesn't get ground balls, that's a really, really volatile. And when I say volatile, I don't mean like could be an ace, could be really bad. I mean like he could be mediocre or he could be really bad. And I think guys like Kremer and Cole Irvin definitely trend more to the the four threes or the five type ERA archetypes on the mound. I think that's worrisome. The the, the bats, I think the bats are going to play, but I think even with the bats, there's some concerns with guys like Cedric Mullins who had some soft tissue, lower half injuries last year. And they're really just young, man. Gunnar Henderson had the oblique injury in spring training. Rushman, I really like, but he's a catcher, man. Those guys get beat up over the course of a season. You can't rely on him to hit 30 home runs. Mount Castle and, and those righties, they really struggle at home because they pushed that wall back 10 feet and raised it 10 feet. So there's definitely things to like about this team. I just think not having uh, not having Felix Bautista in the ninth inning is, is yeah. a huge issue, especially, and this is probably the thing that has me the least bullish about them going into the year. Typically when teams win more than 60% of their games in a it's more than 60% of their one run margin of victory games in a season, they regress significantly the following year, regardless of how good the bullpen is, even though that might seem like in, an intuitive thing. If you have a better bullpen, you win more close games. That's just really not true. Winning and losing one, one run games is usually just a matter of a coin flip. So when teams really overperform or underperform in that area, they typically experience some regression back towards the average the, the next year. Baltimore won 65% of their one run games last year. Now they lose their closer. You get Kimbrell, who is a much, much worse option in the ninth inning. And Cano, I agree with, like probably not the best guy to throw in the ninth inning. I, I just, I, I also bet they're under on their win total. I know that seems crazy after winning 101 games, but there's a lot of ways this season could go wrong for Baltimore. And I don't think there's nearly as many ways as it can go right. And it's not, again, it's not that neither one of us think that they're going to be like a bad baseball team, right. but there's nobody that doesn't, there's not a lot of people talking about the things that what could go wrong for them. Not to yeah. mention the fact that the guys that they have in their, uh, like their major prospects, like Jackson Holiday, Kobe Mayo, Joey Ortiz, Heston Kierstad, all those guys are hitters. No, there's no arms coming up. Obviously they have arms, but I'm just saying like their major prospects are, Arm, yep. arms so it's not like they're getting any more help and i'm telling you guys you have to have arms to compete in this league like there's no question about that and one other thing that i just wanted to touch on uh with um mr corbin burns as well corbin burns is going from a division where he faced the cubs cardinals pirates and reds over and over again the last three years now he's going to a division in the al east where he's playing the rays the yankees the orioles and the red sox and even though the red sox are bad if you go into boston and you're not in 100 percent mental shape you're going to be getting throttled. So it's just one of those things where I just think it's a completely different animal uh, for Corbin Burns this year. So I I'm very curious to see how it plays out. I agree. And speaking of the Red Sox, we can touch on them real quick and then we'll move on. But the Red Sox might not be a good baseball team overall, but they're going to be able to hit. They still got Tristan yeah. Casas. They still got Rafi Devers. They went and got Tyler O'Neill, underrated pickup. You got Sedane Rafaela, top prospect coming up. He's going to play center field. Uh, Jaron Duran in right field. Vaughn Grisham, I think. Vaughn Grisham is a guy last year Everybody loved Vaughn Grisham because he was going to play shortstop for the Braves. Now yeah. he's kind of he's he's one of those post hype guys where everybody's forgot about him. But he's going to play in the middle infield for the Red Sox alongside Trevor Story. There's there's a lot of bats on that team that I yeah. think someone like Corbin Burns is going to have to deal with. I like uh, I like that Emmanuel Valdez, that lefty second baseman they got too. I think that he's pretty decent as well. But yeah, I mean, even even like the guys like Bobby Dahlback, I mean, have some power in that lineup. So if they figure things out, Reese McGuire, mm -hmm. another decent lefty, that's a like that, that's a catcher too. Uh, but just two names I just really wanted to touch on: Brian Bayo, Brian Bayo, and Cutter Crawford. I think that those two guys, when they pitch on a daily basis, or every time that they pitch every fifth day, um, are going to give the Red Sox a pretty damn good ch uh, chance to win. So I would be looking at those guys first five uh, whenever they pitch. Obviously, not every single time, but definitely two names to watch for. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I think I think the pitching is going to be a really interesting thing to follow for the Red Sox because they brought Kyle Bodie in. I think that's one of the most yep. underrated him and Craig Breslow, new leadership coming in. I think the pitching is going to take a huge step forward. I I've taken some stabs in fantasy leagues on so, some Red Sox pitching and I, I I'm with you. I think I might look to play 
some Red Sox pitchers in one way or another early in the season before the market adjusts. The only hitter that I really want to touch on for the Red Sox, Tristan Costas, I think is yeah. a name that everybody's going to know by the end of the season. Last year, guy, so this is guys who walked in at least 12% of their at-bats, had a 12% plus barrel rate, and then just less than 30% K rate. So what this is saying is patient hitters, who can hit the baseball really hard at optimal angles, meaning they're not hitting the baseball into the ground, and then they they don't have major strikeout problems. You can see there's some pretty good names on this list. Matt Olson led the league in homers last year. Schwarber, we know what his what he's trying to do at the plate. Uh, he's not trying to hit for contact, but Otani, Betts, you know, right in the MVP conversation. Judge just hit 62 homers a couple years ago. Soto, Alvarez, Bryce Harper. Casas fits this mold, and it's a really high floor, high ceiling type of type of mold that I think Costas has. I think he's going to have a phenomenal season. I can't wait to watch him play. He hits righties. He hits lefties. He's still very, very young, man. Like I think 25 home runs is the floor. I wouldn't be shocked if he's hitting 35 home runs and is right there alongside Rafi Devers is, is the best hitter on that team by the end of the year. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. And one of the things that this isn't like numbers, this is just me reading about baseball and knowing about baseball is that he's one of those guys. I he has a lot of confidence in himself. He was he took a lot of crap from the veterans um, and how he went about his day to day basis. He would he's one of these guys that like believes in like the power of the sun and good energy <laughs> and stuff like that. And I, I'm not even mocking him. I'm just saying that he was yeah. very confident in what he did. He was confident in his ability. He went through and did his work on a day to day basis. And like and like Kamish just showed you. Um, it showed off in a major way. And being in a group with those names um, is a huge accomplishment. And I, I think he's going to have a fantastic year as well. Completely agree. Well, both on the Rays, I think that's a big takeaway from that division. And maybe just yeah. be a little bit less bullish than your friends are about the the Orioles and the Yankees. And, and I think you'd probably be in good shape in, in the American League East. What about the Central, man? I mean, I, I feel like the Central gets picked on every single year for being absolutely terrible. And it's been deserving the last couple of years. But... Is that going to change in 2024? I think I don't think it's going to change as much as they're going to be looked at as being terrible. But I will say, I I this was the hardest division for me to pick a winner. Um, as far as I just feel like you can make a case for most of these, a lot of these teams besides the White Sox. Like I could honestly hear why and understand why you'd want to pick like the Royals even or the Tigers or the Twins or the Guardians like any one of those great teams I could feel that I can be talked into at least saying that they could be the champion of this league my hope is that there is three or four teams in this with like two or three weeks to go and there's just like an all-out sprint to the finish um, on how it plays out so um, I think that the Twins are at the top uh, but it's like a slim margin but um, yeah I'm curious to see what you're thinking as well yeah, I mean, I, we're pretty aligned. You know, we, we both have the Twins at the top, and then, you know, you have the Guardians second, the Tigers third. I have that flipped, and then we both have the Royals fourth and the and the White Sox down there in the basement. For me, the biggest thing is the, the Twins pitching is is unreal. You, Pablo Lopez at the top with Joe Ryan and Bailey Ober. I think those are two very, very talented pitchers. And then you have a guy like Chris Paddock, who's never been bad when he's been on the mound. He just has never really been healthy. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that. That's a really good foundation for a pitching staff. Pablo Lopez last season, he's someone like, so if you're looking at the Cy Young race in my mind and you have equal odds on a guy like Pablo Lopez and Corbin Burns. And I, and I'll just tell you, I, I grabbed Pablo Lopez at plus 1600 to win the American league Cy Young. And I think he's plus 850 now after Garrett Cole got hurt last year, there was 11 pitchers that threw at least 65% first pitch strikes and had a ground ball rate higher than 45% that threw at least a hundred innings. And the reason that's important is to be a successful pitcher in the big leagues, you either have to be able to get strikeouts or you have to be able to get ground ball outs. If you can do both, that puts you on a really short list. When you get ahead in the count frequently and you have good stuff like Pablo Lopez does, it gives you a great chance to get some strikeouts. You can see the list. Those 11 guys, Tyler Glass now, widely regarded as one of the best pitchers in baseball. Eflin, who we already touched on, Justin Steele and Webb, we're both in the NL Cy Young conversation last year. Bieber coming off of an injured year, but you know we, we've seen what he can do at his peak. And then Sandy Alcantara won a Cy Young. Kershaw's won a Cy Young. This is a he has a skill set that has a lot of upside. And then you look at how soft the Twins' schedule is this year. Pablo Lopez, I have a hundred percent share of him in all my fantasy leagues. I will be on him probably every single day he is on the mound this season. I'll be on the Twins in some capacity. But I really do like Joe Ryan. I like Bailey Ober. Uh, Louis Varland, I think, is another guy, like as a number five guy, has the potential to be very good in that rotation. And 
the biggest thing for me with the twins, the offense, like I, I love what the offense looks like if everybody's on the field, but how many games are we getting out of Buxton? How many games are we getting out of Max Kepler? How many games are we getting out of Royce Lewis? How many, what, what kind of production are we going to get out, out of first base from uh, Krilov and, and Carlos Santana? Julian can't hit lefties, but he mashes righties. Like I think you can poke a lot more holes in the offense than you can the pitching staff. It'll be interesting to see. I, the, the floor is very high for the Twins. Like I can't see them finishing below 500, but I think the offense is going to make or break if this team wins 85 games or 95 games. Yeah, um, I, I do. I I agree with the Twins. I think that they're the. I think that you have to put them at number one in their division in this division because you like you touched on the pitching. I mean, I was also with you with the Pablo Lopez. I I actually think that Joe Ryan is one of the better pitchers that nobody knows about either. Yeah. Um, I I think that he's going to have a, a pretty decent year this year. Um, and he he's one of those guys that came over from the Rays, so you know that the, if the Rays saw yeah. something, he's got to have a little bit of something in there. Um, Bailey Ober, another guy that has continued to get better each and every year and then like you touched on paddock um i mean i i really think that chris paddock is one of those guys that i'm not trying to die on a chris paddock hill but i think he's gonna you're gonna hear his name a lot this year and one of those guys are like man i haven't heard that name in a long time or never heard before um he's gonna be that guy but the lineup like you talked about edward julian um it can absolutely mash but obviously can't play defense doesn't really do it against lefties so um they're gonna have they're going to have to bring in somebody like Kyle Farmer uh, who can figure that out. But I actually think that that isn't that bad. I, I think that Kyle Farmer can can hit you like around 250, 260, uh, slug for around 400 and be okay. And if that's yep. the case, you're good. The issue, like you said, is the two main guys, Buxton and Correa, who are both injury prone. Uh, Buxton is one of those guys where, you know, I, I've told this story before. Like if he rolls out of bed and feels something, he isn't playing that day. So he's saying this spring that he feels good. It's first time he's ran around. He, I feel like he says that stuff every single year i could be lying but i just i mean i just feel like we say it was in the outfield at least year. like i think the one difference this year is he's actually played the outfield in spring training but we saw he's already had back tightness right i was gonna say that's and that's cool but he also yeah. didn't play the outfield last year so now you let his body get used to not playing the outfield i'm not a doctor but he's used to not playing the outfield and now he's gonna go play the outfield every day and we're expecting him to play 150 games or 30 games i don't I think know it's optimistic. I'm there. Yeah, yeah it's very that. optimistic. Yeah. Um, so I'm just not there with that. Again, I think that when he's in the lineup, he's going to be fantastic. Correa has that ankle issue. Um, I'm sure he's going to be fine. But again, that's something that he's going to have to deal with at all times. Royce Lewis, fantastic first round draft pick. We saw what he can do in the playoffs last year, how awesome he'd be. Um, we saw it in the regular season, too, with all the grand, sl grand slams that he hit. Um, another guy with a lot of injury history, two, a, two ACL surgeries already. It's just a lot to ask. So do I like that they added, you know, like a Carlos Santana that's a nice veteran lineup at the bottom of the lineup or bat at the bottom of the lineup? Absolutely. Ryan Jeffers secretly kind of mashes. So can't play defense very well, I don't think, but can secretly mash. And then Kirilov at the bottom is pretty damn uh, – a, for a nine hitter, that's pretty damn decent. So, and then you guys got guys on the bench like Willie Castro, Manuel, Manuel Margot, and Christian Vasquez, who I trust Christian Vasquez behind the plate. And he's shown that he can hit decent at times. He can get hits when you need him to at times. Um, and then Margot is a pretty solid player. So there's just a lot of things to like about the twins. So there's also a lot of things that there's also a lot of reasons to pump the brakes on the twins. And that's what makes this division so fascinating because there's other teams in there like the the Royals and the Reds that are spending money to get even better um, and making it kind of hard to get there. Yeah. But well, why don't we go to the guardians next year? The guardians second in the division. So what, what has to go right for the guardians for them to unseat the twins? Um, their young hitters are going to have to start hitting um, that. I mean, Stephen Kwan, I'm not expecting like a power guy, but we need guys like Bo Naylor, who is a catcher who, I mean, defensively, I think that you have seen him do things that other catchers in this league can't do. I think that he's one of the most, or if not the most athletic catcher we have in this league, which I think that it just brings a different dynamic to this team. Um, guys like Will Brennan, Tyler Freeman, Brian Riccio, or however you pronounce his last name, I apologize. Riccio, yeah. Yeah, like all of those guys, really not good at the plate, but I just feel like if they can just take a couple little baby little steps forward and you have guys like Naylor Ramirez and Jimenez, who was an all-star last year, uh, those guys like that, or at least all-star caliber, 
those can be will be enough because when you scroll down to what they're doing with their pitching is that's where I think that's they're going to be head and shoulders above everybody else, including that Twins team that I talked about with Bieber, McKenzie, Tanner Bybee, and Logan Allen. Um, as far as the guys that are healthy right now, I mean that's as as good as a four that you can get. Um, they, they have other guys as well, but then in the the back end of the bullpen, Class A Barlow, uh, Eli Morgan, Hunter Gaddis. I'm not like the biggest uh, Eli Morgan fan. I mean, but at the same time. I think that he's going to be solidified in that like middle relieving role. He can eat innings when he needs to. Um, the only issue that I have, and I'm sure that uh, commission is going to talk about a little bit more is class a and how much he's been used and whatnot. Um, but I think that the w- one other thing I wanted to touch on is this Cleveland team, very, very young. And they went from having a manager who is very old with a young man's soul in Terry Francona. And now they have Stephen Vogt, who's not even 40 years old himself. So I can feel like it, everybody rallying together and they're uh, this young group of team and they're playing awesome. I can also see it like maybe unfolding a little bit. And again, that just goes back to what makes this division so interesting for me. Yeah, I I agree with you, man. If, if the Guardians won the division, would I be shocked? I, I wouldn't. But if they finished fourth, I probably wouldn't be super surprised either. I think yeah. the, the, the the biggest thing for the – one of the biggest things for the Guardians, and, and I wrote about this about a month ago, the, their outfield offense has been consistently one of the worst in baseball. This, so this is – since Michael Brantley hit 20 home runs all the way back in 2014, nobody else – I mean, this is a decade. This is a legitimate decade – no other primary outfield for the Guardians has hit 20 home runs. In a league that you need home runs to win games, especially to win in the postseason, the Guardians have consistently devalued hitting the long ball in favor of defense, in favor of guys like the Miles Straws and the the uh, Oscar Gonzalez's and the Stephen Quans. And not, not that those guys don't have utility, but to have three of them in the same outfield has right. really hurt this group's offense. And you can see where they've ranked relative to the rest of the league. Since 2017, 26, 29th, 28th, 30th, 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 30th. So over the last four years, they've been dead last in outfield home runs. This year, thank God they cut Miles Straw. I I never like to see anybody lose their job, but when you're trying to see a team win and take that next step, you have to give guys like Evan Florial a chance. You have to give some of these other guys an opportunity to go out there that that just might be able to hit a little bit. And we just know Miles Straw won't be able to hit at all. Um, Pitching wise, I think Shane Bieber, and I, I, I'll, I'll roll over to this here in a second. Shane Bieber, to me, I know a lot of people have lost. What would you call it, Tobes? Like the the luster or like the fandom with a guy like Shane Bieber because he struggled last year and had the injuries. But luster, he, yeah. He went to drive line, and I know everybody. It's it's turned into a uh, like one of those K commercials, right? Like he. He went to K. He went to drive line, right? Okay, but I will stop you there, though. I, 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 at least understand that drive line is something that's making baseball players better. If anything, I understand that that's easy to say he's going to drive line now. But if you don't know what drive line is, it's a place where they make baseball players better with analytics. Yeah. I, I'm not going to go into it, but just know that it's not like I don't think it's as bad as that some people make it out to be. That's all. Yeah, and they know what they're doing. There's a reason that. I mean, they've revolutionized the game from the MLB level down to, I run a baseball academy. We we use their stuff and their programming at the youth level constantly. And, and it works. I mean, it, it really works. I think you can argue at the MLB level now because so many people have adopted it. What's the, how much is it benefiting individual guys relative to the rest of the league? I think that's up for debate. But a guy like Bieber, he is, his success has been directly tied to his fastball velocity. So you can take a look at the last couple of years COVID year, that was his best fastball velo ever, and you can see one of Cy Young was pretty much unhittable. And he's regressed in velo each of the last couple years, down to 93, and then these last couple years at 92. He's back up around 94 in spring training and during his winter sessions at driveline. They had him at 94 miles an hour. Even if he doesn't get back to his 163 ERA, if he can just be a solid high twos, low threes guy at the top of that rotation, that really changes things for the Guardians, who have – a lot of youth behind him. Tristan McKenzie has had one good year and he's had some health issues. Tanner Bybee, like him a lot, very young. Gavin Williams has hurt to start the year and really struggled against lefties last year. And Logan Allen, I know we've talked about more of a back end of the rotation type of guy than someone who could potentially develop into an ace. So there's a lot of potential with that team on the pitching staff, but there's also a lot of youth, a lot of downside. The bullpen stuff, Class A, since the beginning of... 20 was it 2021 the last three years 
Class A has pitched in 152 games. I'll bring it up so you guys can see on the screen here as well. Most in baseball over that stretch. And what happened last year is you started to see the velo was down a little bit. The strikeouts were down. Uh, you can see the, the the numbers against his elite cutter in 2022. And then 2023, a lot less elite. That's problematic in the ninth inning, especially we lost Trevor Steppen in the eighth inning, season-ending injury. Are guys like Eli Morgan going to step into a high-leverage role? Because James Karinchak, we don't know what he's going to look like. That. He was hurt to start the year. So I think there's some concerns with the bullpen. And the front office just seems completely unwilling to add veteran talent this year. They've said time and time again this offseason, they will let the young guys play, which means Manzardo is going to come up, which means you're going to have a lot of at-bats for Rokio and you know the younger guys in the infield. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this team. The upside is certainly there. I just think you're going to have to have a lot of young guys play to high level, plus Jose Ramirez. I'm not worried about him at all, but you're going to have to have Jose Ramirez plus a lot of young guys play to really high level for this group to really hit their ceiling. Not to mention the fact that I wanted to say that, like, I've read countless times that Cleveland doesn't feel like they're in like a bad spot as far as guys without hitting for power. They feel like this league isn't going that essentially what I read was that they feel like they're going to be ahead of the curve when this game isn't always about home runs and strikeouts. But the fact is that they were <laughs> still living in a here and now age where yep. it matters. So they're waiting. They think that, like, in three or four years, they're going to be way ahead of the curve. And I don't even know if that's going to be really. I doubt it. Dallas, but I don't either. So we'll see. I think that's what they try to sell the fans. I'm not really sure. But I mean, could you imagine if they just spent like a little bit of money, how decent that team would be? I mean, it's well, look just what happened ridiculous. in 2016 when they added guys like Edwin Encarnacion and they went and traded for Andrew Miller and they added around the edges to a really strong core. Man, Andrew Miller was nails too. I know. But he was another guy. Like, I think he's a good comp for someone like Colossae where Tito just ran Andrew Miller into the ground. And then he went from being elite and everybody's calling him nasty and all these beautiful names and then he was just out of baseball i mean he was with the cardinals but he was hurt and then he was out of baseball i i don't think that's going to be the case for Classe, but he's a guy who, he's really a one-trick pony i mean his slider is pretty good too but the cutter is really his bread and butter and if that pitch isn't able to get back to where it was it's a concern so i had him finishing third you had him second i, I mean i think both of us if they finished fourth it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the most crazy thing in the entire world, <laughs> no, but. not at all, not in any way, shape, or form. It wouldn't be surprising to me if the, this division was so close. They were first going into this four, uh, three weeks into this going yep. uh, to the end of the season, and then they finished fourth. Like it, it's, yep. I truly believe this is it could be this close in this division. I agree. Well, what about the Tigers? The Tigers are my team that I have finishing second in that division. What what made you put them third below the Guardians? Um, the Tigers for me are here. Hold on, let me bring up my notes with them really quickly. The Tigers are one of those teams that I just I feel like for the last couple of years have been making pretty decent strides. And the fact that we're going to get the fact that sorry, my kid just woke up. We're gonna have to cut that if we can. But um it's all right, we anyway, have guests on this show. We're pro guests. Yeah, it's my bad. But anyway, the fact that they're pitching, I think, is really, really better than people want to give them credit for. The only pitcher in that rotation that I even really worry about is Jack Flaherty. And when I say worry about is I'm talking about as far as like average guys i'm not trying to make a case for these guys are like all-stars or anything like that but scooble is a guy that i feel like is everybody's dark horse one of those dark horse cy young candidate guys which it makes sense he's been awesome uh a lefty that is probably going to give you an era under three three um as long as he can stay healthy um and probably 175 to 200 strikeouts like there's no question that Tariq scooble is the man it's the question is what do you get out of kenta maeda casey mize and reese olsen i th i'm still a guy that i think casey mize who's a first round draft pick one of one type guy i still think that he's going to pitch well at some time in his career i could be wrong at that um but i I don't think that you get drafted that high and, and for no reason. And, and he's shown it some at some points in the major league as well. Reese Olsen is another guy that, uh, again, I, I just come into this year. If he can have an ERA around four or under and, you know, like a hundred and, you know, 130, 135 strikeouts type of thing. Um, I think they're going to be fine because if you remember last year, their bullpen was actually secretly pretty good. I mean, Alex Lang and Jason Foley, two guys that are pretty damn decent um, that are, really especially laying a really good strikeout artist shelby miller is a guy that came over from the dodgers that is actually i mean actually secretly pitched really well for them last year andrew chafin is a guy that is a veteran presence in that bullpen that's i mean i'm getting nothing fantastic but he's not a, a reliable a reliability that's for sure a liability excuse me and then if you take a look at the lineup parker meadows 
Um, one, a second round guy that I, I do think is going to be pretty good. But the three guys that I wanted to talk about is Spencer Torgelson, Riley Green, and Kerry Carpenter. All those guys that can hit for power, uh, they can hit for average. Everything that you could want, they are there. Not to mention they're all first round draft picks in this organization. Um, I, I, and then you have a guy like Mark Canna, who I think that we saw with Milwaukee started out pretty high when he got traded, obviously, and then kind of went down. I think that's a very good solid piece in this lineup. Um, Colt Keith is one of their younger guys as well. I think Gio Urshela is like, I'm actually like a Gio Urshela guy. I think that Gio Urshela is a pretty solid baseball player. And if you're going to have him playing third base, essentially every day with Matt Veerling coming in and giving him a day off or whatever. Um, and he's batting eighth. I think that's a pretty solid eight guy. Um, and then Jake Rogers is a defensive specialist. And then, and then obviously you have Javi Baez who can't hit for shit, but at the same time, he's still one of the best defensive shortstops in, in major league baseball. Uh, and there's and just a no really good left side of the infield with with yeah, Javi so and Gio or Shell on the left side of the infield. That's that's phenomenal. It, two of the yeah. most important positions on the diamond. So I, I just think that the like I said, I think the Tigers are a little bit better than people want to give them credit for. There's just issues with that pitching staff with how young they are. And Jack Flaherty hasn't really been good for a long time. But I think the yeah. bullpen is much much better than people want to give them credit for. And if Mize Olson and Maeda can be somewhat confident, I, I really think that they're going to be a lot better than people think. Yes, yeah, so you, you mentioned the bullpen. I was just pulling it up while you were talking right there. And the, the bullpen last year, you can see this was after the All-Star break. And here's the Tigers. So whip, one of the most important characteristics when you're looking at bullpen, how often are we allowing walks plus hits per inning pitch? So basically just how many base runners per inning. Top half of the league in whip. And then FIP, again, is a more predictive measurement than just looking at raw ERA when you're evaluating pitchers and pitching staffs. And they were 11. So top half of the league bullpen the second half of last year and now you go add a guy like Andrew Chafin, who struggled last season with Arizona, but the last really good season Chafin had was actually with the Tigers. And now you get him back, you add a lefty to this bullpen outside of the ninth inning. I think there's only room to go up for that group. I really like Will Vest, who's probably going to see some high leverage work in the eighth. So I'm with you on the bullpen. And then you have, I mean, you said it so, so perfectly, right? The offense, the guys that the Detroit tanked for, Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, the Colt Key, like all these first round picks, Casey Mize is coming up. They're finally here. Like Houston tanked for Correa and Bregman and Springer. Detroit, Detroit's guys just haven't all been here. Riley Green's been hurt the last couple of years. It took Torkelson a year and a half to get going. But last season, Torkelson, once he got going, homered at a 45 home run pace the last two months of the season. I mean, you talk about a guy that has a ton of upside. And then yeah, T Tariq Skubal, you want, you want to know how good he was last year for people who love dad and love to nerd out like me? After he came back, so this is after he was finally stretched out in late July. He wasn't on strict pitch counts anymore. Best FIP in baseball, and it wasn't even close. I had a guys like Glass now, Michael King, Grayson Rodriguez. And you did, again, like you you look at guys, can they get strikeouts? Can they and can they avoid walks? Nobody did that better last year than Skubal in the second half of the season. North of a 30K percentage, virtually no free passes, which I think separates him tremendously from guys like the Cole Reagans. And, Thank you. Know, some you. Of these so I love Scooble. I think the back end of that rotation, I, I like to think that they're going to be fine. I think Flaherty and Maeda, they're, they're better than running out some of the guys that they've had the last couple of seasons. If Reese Olsen can take a step forward, that's a, a pretty solid one too. But it's really going to be the offense that's going to make or break for them. I mean, like you need Riley Green healthy. You need Torkelson to keep right. improving. Colt Keith has to be at least league average at second base. Parker Meadows, I think, is going to swallow everything in the outfield. I think the I think the Tigers have the potential to be a top 10 defense, especially you mentioned Urshela and Javi over there. I like this team. I, I bet them to win 80-plus games. I know the line has moved a little bit at this point. I really feel like that's where they end up. I feel like they end up plus or minus 80 by a couple of wins. I don't think they have as good of a pitching staff after Scooble as the Guardians or the the Twins. The offense, I think, is probably better than the Guardians, but not as good as the Twins. So I, I it's tough for me to think they're going to win the division outright, but I, I'm with you, Toast. I, I think they're going to be in the conversation for the vast majority of the season, and anything less will be a huge disappointment. Yeah, if they're not in, yeah, I would agree. It's a, it'd be a huge disappointment. They also play, like, just for those that who do bet baseball, anytime Detroit plays a home game that's, like, at noon Eastern or 1 Eastern or something yep. like that, that's a, one of the best times to bet this team. It's like they never lose during the day at home. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. 
I agree. Well, Royals and then White Sox. What do, you, what do you got for the Royals? And then we'll talk about the one or two guys on the White Sox that are worth <laughs> talking about. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. You know, the Royals and the Tigers are uh, very similar to me. Like you can find when you start looking up and down the roster, you find a lot of things you like. Like for me, I start obviously with the Royals with the pitching staff. Cole Reagans, um, if you're watching this show or listening, I'm sure you know who this is, um, who came over in the trade last year um, and absolutely set the world on fire. Um, I personally think that Scooble's a little bit better than him, um, but that's just that's just me personally. Um, but two guys that they brought over from my Padres, Lugo and Waka, I, I can assure you guys those are very solid arms. Um, both of those guys um, came over in – uh, San Diego last year and pitched very, very well. Uh, Michael Walker is uh, something like 23 and four the last three years or something like that. Um, so there's no question about like those two, those three Reagan's Lugo and Walker are a solid three. Brady Singer can't really get worse than what you did last year for them. So I think that anything positive and a positive step for them is again, you're adding, you're going to be better than what you were last year. Um, and he wasn't as bad as, it seemed last right. year. I mean, they, they had a horrific defense behind him, and he was a, he's a big ground ball guy. It's, it reminds me of Eduardo Rodriguez for a while with the Red Sox. Every year, people were like, "Oh, he's got so much talent," and then he, and then his numbers just weren't that great. Everybody's like, "Oh, you know, like are, are we just wrong about him?" And then he went to a team that had a halfway decent defense in the Tigers, and he actually looked pretty damn good the last two years. Yeah, and then as far as the the uh, bullpen is concerned, James McArthur. I mean, again, not, none of these guys are like. Uh, amazing, amazing arms. But I, is, is, when you're looking at the context of the AL Central, they're going to be all right. Will Smith, a guy that came over from Texas that, I mean, is a veteran that continues to pitch well. John Schreiber coming over from Boston. Nick Anderson coming over from Atlanta. I mean, they, Chris Stratton coming over from Texas as well. Like, there, There's a lot of guys in there that as long as they pitch, as long as they're just not getting absolutely throttled, there should be just fine. And then that's when you get to the offense that you find a lot of things that you could possibly like. I mean, Bobby Witt Jr. is is a dark horse Cy, or Cy Young, dark horse MVP candidate. Vinny Pasquantino, if he's healthy, um, can definitely hit you close to 300 and slug close to 500 um, and probably hit you, I don't know, 25 to 30, if not more home runs. Um, Salvador Perez obviously continues to just do whatever he does on every single year. Um, it's hard to say anything bad about Salvi. MJ Melendez doesn't have to worry about catching or anything like that. Now all he has to worry about is playing outfield and hitting the baseball. And that's what MJ Melendez does. He can hit Hunter Renfro, Adam Frazier, um, both of those guys, solid veterans in the lineup that again, probably going to hit 260, hopefully around there. And if that's the case and they come in and, and what hundred, 350, 400 plate appearances, if they give you all that with guys like Freddie Furman and Nikki Lofton on the bench, like there's, there's, there's a road to success here with Kansas city. Do they all stay healthy? Do they all take a step forward is the question, but there's definitely pieces in this roster that you can find positives about. There's no question about that. Yeah, I, I'm with you pretty much lock and step right there. I th Melendez, to me, is the most interesting guy in this roster. I, I was doing my preseason prep, and he was he was god-awful before the All-Star break last year, and then he really came to life end of July through the end of the season. I was really trying to figure out what happened. And if you go look back at some of his, his swings, it seemed like he was starting his hands a little bit lower, a little bit closer to his body earlier in the season. And second half, he came out a little bit of an adjustment – to where he was starting, it looked like it was letting him get on plane a little bit more. And you can see the splits here. I mean, the OPS jumped over 200 points. The batting average jumped 70 points. Uh, he still walks at a high rate. Like, this is a guy who should be solidly league average at worst. And like you said, he doesn't have to catch. He doesn't have to worry about a, a much tougher position defensively. Like he can just hit. I think that's a huge benefit for them. Brady Singer is a guy for me that last year – I think it was really tough for him. He went to the World Baseball Classic, and I think in hindsight, he probably should have just gone to spring training with the, with the Royals. He had a really, really strong 2022, and then last year just lost some, some of that strikeout stuff and then was overly reliant on a really bad defense behind him. I think you're definitely going to see a better version of Brady Singer this year. My biggest piece of advice from a betting perspective with this team is Cole Reagans probably isn't the goods. I like Cole Reagans. He's not bad, but... He, that's long, blasphemy long on Twitter. Twitter. Don't let the people on Twitter hear you say that, Kamish. Cole Reagans can't do anything bad on Twitter. Somebody asked me what what my take was on Cole Reagans going into this season, and then I sent him back my, my detailed notes. I and mean, you can find it like in my Substack, and I've tweeted it too. Like 
some pretty extensive notes on Cole Reagans. I like him. Like his Vila was way up last year. His strikeouts went way up, but he still didn't throw a lot of strikes. The teams that he faced really weren't that great in that stretch. And he's still like he's got the same pretty bad defense behind him that that everybody else in that rotation does. And the Royals uh baseball prospectus has them projected for the 30th ranked defense in, in baseball this year. So Cole Reagan, I just don't love him, man. I I know people are gonna crucify me. They're probably gonna think, oh, Kamish doesn't know ball when, when they when they hear me say this to start the season, but there's just a lot of things that I don't love about Cole Reagan's relative to other guys that we've now put him in the conversation with, like Pablo Lopez, like Tyler Glass. And like those are guys that I hear Reagan's being compared to, and I just think that's insane. Truthfully, he's gonna be good. He's not gonna win a Cy Young. I mean, I would I would take whatever odds someone gave me at whatever dollar amount, and I would bet him to not win the Cy Young. I was on mute, but yeah, I 100% agree. I, I, again, it's not like I'm trying to take shots at Cole Reagans, but at the same time, like it, like you talked about, you look at the teams that he pitched against with a, a shaky defense behind him uh, that sometimes has a issue throwing strikes at times. Yeah, I, I get it. Again, I would love to see him pitch well and Waka and Lugo and all those guys pitch well and KC to make a run this summer. I, I would love that, but I just, yeah, again, there's reasons to be cautious as well. That's all we're trying to tell you guys. That's all. Yep. And then just so you can see too, I pulled it up. Uh baseball prospectus. They're not just projected to be the worst defense. They're projected to be the worst defense by a pretty significant margin. You can see the Nationals 29th, negative 21 uh deserve runs prevented, and then the Royals down here in 30th. So pretty substantial difference too between some of the teams in their division. Like you look at the Guardians up here, uh fourth. Tigers could be a top 10 defense. The twins are up here around the top 10 as well. So when you're looking for reasons why maybe the Kansas City Royals don't take that jump. That's it. But again, like you said, Toast, they spent a lot of money in free agency. They have some young guys. Bobby Witt is a franchise cornerstone. There, there's reasons to like them, and I think it's really important. The front office is trying to win. They were embarrassed by what they did last year. Yes. And, but this is what's so interesting about this division is the Guardians, I think, are undeniably more talented than the Royals, but also trying a lot less hard to win. The Royals have less talent, but the front office – Everything out of spring training was, yeah, our goal is to win the division. We want to make the playoffs. It's pretty, it's I, I, pretty you ambitious, You took the man. words out of my mouth. You took the words out of my mouth. It just feels like they're trying and they care, mm -hmm. and that's going to go a long way in this division that has some divisions that might not be trying, or teams that might not be trying, it seems yeah. like. Like the White Sox. Anybody from the White Sox you want to highlight before we head over to the, the final division of the American League? Not really, unless you have any. Hold on. Let me go put him in his room. No, you're on. good. You're good. Yeah, we're, we're going to have guests on this show from time to time, so uh, absolutely no stress at all with Toshi. You guys will probably meet my dog at some point. He, he, he tends to come down here. I think he's napping right now. But uh, only guy that, I would, that I'm that i going to highlight from, from the White Sox this upcoming season is, is Eric Fetty. This is a guy who was a, an automatic fade last season, or not last season, but the last couple seasons that he was in the big leagues. I'll pull up his, his numbers here. But Eric Fetty went over to the KBO, and I know nobody in America follows the KBO, and it's like anybody who's not playing in Major League Baseball doesn't deserve respect is sometimes the vibe that people have towards those guys overseas. But Eric Fetty went over there in a league that prioritizes contact over all else and put up a 2 ERA and a 238 FIP. You look at his K percentage, almost 30%. Looks a little bit like that guy's Tariq Skubal that we mentioned a few minutes ago. Really high K percentage, really low walk rate. Uh, important thing is, he went over there. It wasn't like he just had good luck against different talent. He completely revamped his arsenal, added a sweeper. So he's getting more swings and misses against righties, revamped the changeup, getting more swings and misses against lefties. Do I think he's going to win a Cy Young this year for the White Sox? Absolutely not. But is there one guy who, if, you, if I'm every single day, if I'm looking to potentially fade the White Sox, there, if the, there's one guy in that rotation that would give me pause, it would be Eric Fetty, especially to start the year. I think I think there's potential that he has a really nice season. If you're look if you haven't done your fantasy draft yet and you're looking for a late round flyer that could potentially have a really good year for you, I think Fetty is that guy. I also think that the White Sox are similar to the Royals. I know they just traded Dylan Sees, but the White Sox are a team that was really, really embarrassed by what they put on the field last year in the last couple of years. They went out and upgraded the defense. They they went out and got Maldonado behind the plate, uh, and Max Stassi behind the plate. They put Paul DeYoung at shortstop. They're going to be better defensively than they have been. It would be hard for them to be worse, to be frank. They've been one of the worst defensive teams in the league for half of a decade now. So the White Sox should be better. I 
are they going to win 75 games? No, but they might not lose 100 games optimistically. We'll see. Losing yeah. Dylan Cease for half the season hurts, uh, for sure. Yeah, it does hurt. Um, I, the only other thing I just wanted to say is that th it's very possible that you can see guys like if you have guys like Moncada and Robert start the year hot, they and put their value up a little bit. You might see those guys get traded away. Um, and then the only other guy that I guess I just kind of wanted to not even like go in depth, but just touch on White Sox fans like Drew Thorpe is a stud. Um, he, he's one of the guys that came over in the in the cease trade. Um, just watch him out for him because he, he should be a stud. He's one of those guys that 35 out of 35 on a fastball, really good change up. Um, solid command. Um, there's just a lot of things to like about him. So when you start hearing his name come up, uh, Drew Thorpe, is, Drew Thorpe, excuse me, is one of those guys that you're definitely going to want to watch. Yeah, and uh, another guy that got basically for free last year was I don't know how to say his last name, Edgar Cuero, the catching prospect from the Angels. Yeah, I don't know how to say that. Yeah, no, I know exactly who you're talking. We'll learn about. how to say it. I'm sure at some point this year. I, I think he's going to probably be up in the big leagues, but they, they got a, a nice collection of prospects getting rid of C's and and last year Giolito and some of the guys that they sold. Yeah, he's number. Uh, uh, I saw. I keep calling. I call him Edgar Cuevo because it's just easier in my <laughs> head to remember yeah. it that way. But Edgar is uh, their fourth best prospect in their um, in their in their system. So yeah, yeah. I like him a lot. He played in double A last year. He should be coming up here sooner than later. Yep. hundred percent agree. Well, last but not least, your, your favorite division to talk about because you have your favorite American league team, maybe not your favorite, yeah. but the bad boys who you have winning this right. division once again in 2024 to tell us why toast. Well, as I think Alex Bregman said it the best, everybody wondered why, what it would be like if Houston didn't win the uh, win the division. But I guess we're just going to have to wait. Okay, keep on waiting because this team just doesn't fucking win the division. Like, I'm sorry, but at no point are you going to convince me. And I love Seattle and we can we're going to talk about them in a second. But I just here I just don't understand. Besides the starting pitching that you can start poking holes through, that's really the only thing that you can poke holes through with this Houston Astros team. Valdez, Javier, Brown, Blanco, France is your starting five. Um, Javier, one of those guys that in October uh, has been fantastic over the course of 162, hasn't been as dominant. Framber Valdez is another one of those guys as well. Um, but both of those guys are going to be coming up for contract contract soon. They're both four years of service time. Um, I, I truly think that we're going to get pr uh, pretty good performances out of those guys, not to mention guys like Justin Verlander, who I understand that he's hurt and whatnot, but he should be ready to go um i guess i'll put it this way it's easier to figure out this way i like them as a playoff team more than i like them over the course of 162 i feel like there's going to be two week three weeks periods where maybe the astros aren't playing good at times over the course of 162 but when we get into october it's not going to matter and why do i feel that way three reasons hater presley abreu and if you wanted to throw montero in there you can those three at the back end of that are of that bullpen is absolutely nasty uh, Josh Hader, I don't really love him as a player. Um, I just don't like what he gives to the team as far as I'm a Padre. And it's not because we, he didn't sign with us. It's because we were in a little bit of a playoff race last year and he didn't want to pitch when we asked him to pitch. And that just doesn't vibe well with me. Um, obviously at Houston has guaranteed him the ninth inning. So he doesn't have to pitch when there's an eight on the scoreboard. So luckily for and Josh Hader, he's going to be in that yeah, that's um, he's worried about his injury concerns going into free agency too, which has such also rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, it's just I don't even want to talk. Yeah, so anyway, Ryan Presley, who is one of the better um, closers in, as far as playoff closers of all time. I mean, I, I truly believe that at this point he's up there with Mariano Rivera. I mean, I don't think he's nearly as good, but he's definitely in that consideration. What he's done over the past three or four years in the playoffs has been absolutely amazing. Brian Abreu is one of. If you don't know who Brian Abreu is, I would take some time to figure out who he. He is. He's one of the best relievers that you probably don't know of in this league. Um, an absolute stud. Um, I, I, it's just really hard for me not to like this Astros team. And then if you go up to the top, Jose Altuve, J Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker, Alex Bregman, Jose Abreu, Yanier Diaz, finally a catcher that I guess the defense is going to go. I, I, I will say that Diaz, you're going to get a very good bat with him compared to what you used to have with Maldi, I do worry a little bit to start the year not having Maldi with that pitching staff because he was such he was so good behind the plate. Luckily, Diaz was with them last year, so I wouldn't worry about that. 
Chaz McCormick, Jeremy Pena, Jake Myers to, to round it out. But then you also have guys like Marcio Dupont and Corey Jolks on the bench. Um, they're just so very deep. Um, Chaz McCormick is another one of those guys. I think that he could have a breakout year, going to be playing every day now. Uh, Jeremy Pena, we've seen him have flashes of very good, especially in the playoffs. Uh, he struggled a little bit last year. I'd be curious to see where he is this year. But there's just really hard for me to find any holes with this Astros team. I know Kamish has a couple of question marks with this team as far as the pitching-wise goes. But for me as a whole, I don't really worry about it. I still think they're going to win 95 to 100 games this year, and they're going to be one of the better teams come um, come playoff time. So that's just how I feel. And I one part of it is that I just continue to ride this team until they showed me not to. But, yeah, it, it's worked for the last five years, so it might not might as well work here and now i got the best closer one of the best closers in the game to add to my bullpen i'll take my chances and he might pitch back-to-back -back days for you guys on occasion i doubt it <laughs> Fucking bum. look so this is my al west i have the mariners winning their their first division title in 20 something years we'll see we'll, we'll see I, I, my biggest thing with the astros and I, it, it really has more to do with the astros than it does with the mariners the reason I have the Mariners win, winning this division. And it's because with the Astros, the, the pitching staff to me is a huge concern for the regular Agreed. season. Agreed. And we've talked about this off the show too. During the postseason, I'm, I'm totally fine with what they have because they're going to be able to go to the bullpen so quick. Brian Abreu could close for any team in baseball. Presley, same way. And Hayter, obviously. The thing that worries me the most is – Guys like Justin Verlander, who are now going to be 41 years old and have experienced their fair share of injuries, you can see last year was not nearly as good as he was in 2022, and 2022 benefited from a really low average on balls in play. The interesting thing with Verlander, on top of the fact that he's starting the season injured, we really don't have a huge case study of guys who are 41 years old pitching at the MLB level. I went back to the last 10 years, and you can see a lot of Bartolo Colon, some R.A. Dickies in here, Adam Wainwright last year was the worst pitcher in baseball. We know, we know how that went. So I think the the upside with Verlander is very low. As I love Justin Verlander watching him pitch, even even though he would beat my Cleveland Guardians for you know the first eight years of his career, however long he was in Detroit. I just always had such respect for him as a pitcher. I just don't know if he has it anymore. The velo has been down. He's turned a lot more into like a Kershaw, try to induce weak contact type of pitcher than he is someone who's going to go strike out 25% of the guys he faces. There's not a lot of upside there, but I do think there's a pretty considerable amount of downside with Justin Verlander. A guy like Framber Valdez, really, really liked him two years ago. Last year, and this is an interesting argument for the people who say velocity isn't everything. Last year, velocity on all of his pitches was up pretty considerably. You can see the sinker was up here above 95 miles an hour. The problem is when you throw a pitch like a sinker with more velo, it's not going to dance as much. He lost about four inches of vertical drop on average on that pitch. So his ground ball weight rate went down. He really was just not as effective overall. So I think if he's not an ace ace, if he's more of a co-ace or like a, like a tier two type pitcher, for, from a regular season perspective, that makes things tougher on the Astros. And then you look at the rest of this rotation. I'm, I'm not a big Christian Javier guy. He's a strikeout, walk, fly ball type of guy, which is just not my cup of tea. There, you don't see a lot of consistent success with those types of pitchers. And then at the end of the rotation, I like Hunter Brown, but JP France is one of those sub 20 K percentage guys. Mm -hmm. You're just, you're not going to have a lot of su sustained success as an MLB pitcher. If you can't get strikeouts, he's going to probably have more innings. than I think most Astros fans would be comfortable with was a little bit more lucky than good in my opinion last year. But again, the bullpen's elite. So they're, they're, they're not at risk in my mind of completely falling on their face. I think you just, you're at the end of a, a really impressive long run of dominance that we have not seen in this game in a really long time because it's not just that the Astros have won a couple of championships. It's that they've been to the ALCS seven years in a row. It's that they continuously win 95 to 100 games and are one of the best teams in baseball. It's really hard to do that for obvious reasons. One of them, age. Jose Altuve is now going to be 34 years old. We, we, we've never seen Altuve's level of production at second base transcendent to 34, 35 years old. We just haven't seen it at the position. Is Altuve going to be an exception? Maybe. Bregman's going into a contract year, which makes me excited about Bregman on top of the fact that he's just always a really good baseball player, always available. Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker are two of the best hitters in all of baseball. So 
there's a lot to like about the Astros, but like you said earlier, you need arms to win consistently during the regular season. And I think a team like the Mariners, who, who have five pr pretty good arms, three really good arms, and the Astros, I think, are more – in the like they have two or three pretty good arms and some guys that really give you some pause at the back of that rotation. Yeah. One, I, I did want to bring up one guy to watch for the Astros that I think that he will see so, sooner or later this year is Spencer Arenati. If I'm saying his last name wrong, I, I apologize, Spencer, but um, has very good fastball slider combo. He had like 142 strikeouts over like 124 innings in double A AA and triple A last year. Um, and a lot of people like the fact that he has that high velocity and stuff that, that it works with big league hitters. So I think that he's going to come up. He's like one of their higher prospects uh, there. So there is, like you could, I can see him coming in and maybe not have it, maybe pitching like the fifth, fifth and sixth, seventh innings type of deal, um, and taking a little bit of weight off that bullpen and taking a little bit of weight off the starter. So, um, just other things to take a look at as far as baseball wise. But the Astros are also, we all know, are willing to make their team better. So, um, it's just again, sometimes in these situations where I, I'm never not disagreeing with Kamish at all, but there's, and I'm sure he agrees with this too, there's just certain organizations that I trust, and the Astros are in that group. 100%. But I trust that they're going to do the right, make the right decisions. And what, dude? We'll we'll get to it later in this division. But I, I, I could not agree more. Like the Angels are a division, are a team that an organization <laughs> yeah. that, even if I can convince myself that I like some of their talent, I can also convince myself that the organization is going to find a way to They're get the least amount yep. out of that talent. So. Yep. I completely agree. But what about the and Mariners? One other thing, I, I also want to say other thing about Christian Javier is he should be watched very closely this year because last year, I think, especially if you're like kind of new to baseball, you can look at like his win loss record and be like kind of impressive, but he was getting, and I'm exaggerating right now, but like nine runs a game, like any time that Christian Javier stepped on the mound for the Astros, they were putting up at least six. And when you're getting six runs and you're giving up five, that doesn't mean that you're pitching well. That just means that your offense had a really good day. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And again, the, the skill set for a guy like Javier is just very volatile. When, when he can get strikeouts, he's like you saw in gonna, Minnesota in the playoffs. Yeah. Untouchable. Yeah. After so June 21st to the end of the season last year, Javier had a 620 ERA and a 558 FIP. So you were not exaggerating. He allowed 56 earned runs in 81 innings. And I'm curious to see what his win loss record was. Let me see. He here. was three and four during that stretch, which is okay. pretty damn good for a guy who was so he was ten and yeah, and he was ten and five total on the year, yep. which is just crazy. <laughs> so we'll see. But but the Mariners, you're so you're not you're not low on the Mariners. You just you no. like the bad boys. You trust the the Astros. So i I agree with you. Obviously, I have the Mariners winning the division. There's a lot to like about Seattle. What, what are some of the notable points that you think are important for people to know going into opening day? So for me, like, and I told him this, I told Kamish this before the show, like I like to be that guy that stirs things up. So I would love to be the guy that came on here and was like, yo, Seattle's going to dethrone the Astros, yada, yada, yada. I'm just not there yet as far as dethroning them because I have to see it again. One of those things I have to see with my eyes first, but everything that you could possibly ask for is there. I think that Seattle has the best pitching staff in the major league baseball. And I don't even, there's not even a question about it to me. Um, I won't listen to any other arguments. I do not care. Uh, Castillo, Kirby, Gilbert, Miller, Wu, uh, the best starting starting five that you you're going to get as far as pitching or pitching rotation you're going to get. Um, I, I you can poke some holes in Castillo and stuff like that, but I truly think that Gilbert, Kirby, Miller, and Wu um, haven't even reached their potential yet, and is only going to continue to get better. Behind them, behind Munoz and Stanek coming over from the Astros, uh, Saucedo, Thornton. I mean, that bullpen is absolutely nasty. Uh, JP Crawford is, God dang it, dude. JP Crawford is one of those guys that's been fantastic for them. That's, yeah. I think that's like one of the more underrated guys. I'm so sorry. This no, you're good. You're gonna you're gonna meet my dog um, at some point, Toast. We're we're gonna have it's gonna be the same thing. Of course, he like wakes up like right now. But anyway, uh, <laughs> JP good. Crawford is one of the guys that like Hassan Kim, I think could be the Hassan Kim of this year that like everybody falls in love with. They finally understand who he is. Julio Rodriguez had like a sophomore slump last year. Um, and then finally that. Um, and then um, Jorge Polanco. Here, hold on. I got to Hold on. I'm no, you're good. You're good. I'll jump in. 
Yeah. No, we are we are family friendly on this show. Again, you'll meet my dog at some point. I'm sure there'll be some distractions. Uh, new age of doing content in media, but for me, the Mariners, I you know, Toast started to touch on uh, some of it a little bit. The the biggest thing with them is they they haven't won a division in 20 years. You know, we talk about trusting an organization or not trusting an organization. The Mariners are one of those organizations that you probably lean towards not trusting because they just always find a way to come up short in, in one respect or another. But there are just so many good things to say about the pitching staff. And if there is any room to to shift out of that, like I don't, I no longer trust the Seattle Mariners, they're starting to do some pretty good things uh, with the staff. They throw a lot of strikes. I mean, it's one of those things where like the Rays last year were – the last couple of years have been one of those teams where they're getting the most out of the lease with the pitching staff. The Mariners, I think, are getting to that point as well. Even if you poke holes in Castillo – uh, you know, for not having a, a super great ground ball rate anymore. If you have uh, some issues with the fact that Logan, Logan Gilbert gives up a ton of hard contact or Kirby doesn't strike out 27% of the batters he faces, they throw a lot of strikes and they play pretty good defense behind them. That And they play in a really pitcher-friendly ballpark. Like, that gives you a pretty high floor day in and day out, especially when they're at home. Uh, Kirby last year, just absolutely phenomenal in terms of control. Nobody walked less batters than him th over the course of a regular season. And when you talk about skill sets that play, skill sets that have a high floor, 22% K rate was even better towards the second half of last season. And when you don't walk guys and you get a league average number of strikeouts, you can see this list here. Eflin, Steele, Wheeler, Garrett Cole, Webb, Zach Gallon, like all of those dudes were in the conversation to win the, their Cy Young in their respective league last year. George Kirby, if he's able to add a few more swings and misses on a consistent basis, I think is as good as any pitcher in the American League, if not all of baseball. When you throw as many strikes as he does, if he can get us a few more swings and misses, an absolute stud on the mound, I think a very high floor. Castillo and Gilbert, very high on them as well. The four and five guys, you can definitely poke a lot more holes in, but they're four and five guys behind three guys that could probably be an ace for most teams. I think I think it's unfair to, to criticize them too much, especially for how young they are. Yeah. Um, I love this team and sorry again, guys, that's usually not like this. I don't, yeah, it's really, it's th completely throwing me off here to my game here, but yeah, <laughs> I love this team. I, I really am not going to, I really can't any add much. I just, I really love this team. And I think that if there's anybody that wasn't the Astros in front of them, I'd be picking them to win the division because of their pitching yep. and their hitting Julio Rodriguez was worried about having a sophomore slump last year. And he was like one of the best players on their team. So I, I just, there's no voting. Yeah, it's yeah, just down it, talking about something. It's just one of those things where, like, it's just really hard to find reasons not to like this Seattle team. My only issue is it's, again, I don't know if it's an organization that I trust. I understand that they're going to make moves, but yeah. are those moves always beneficial? I'm not really sure. Is it worth always shaking up the clubhouse? I mean, look at the last couple of years when they've made these moves at the towards the uh, uh, trade deadline. Like, when they lost Kendall Graven, the clubhouse, that, that was, like, not yeah. a good thing in the clubhouse. So um, there's positives and there's negatives to trades and stuff like that. Jerry Depoto will trade anything at any time and any day. Uh, so it's one of those things where you can definitely be excited with Seattle – also, history can also tell us that there's reasons to kind of worry at times, too. So, uh, But as far as what's on paper, absolutely yeah. dominant, especially from that pitching staff. Absolutely dominant. 100% agree. I think the last thing I'll add is Ty France went to driveline this past <laughs> winter with, with J.P. Crawford. And, like, I, I get it. I get it. You know, he went to driveline. It is literally – it has definitely turned into a cliche in Major League Baseball. But there are guys who go there – who their skill set can benefit a ton. What driveline does is it, it basically just, they take your movements, they, they get your biomechanics and they help you move more efficiently to hit the baseball harder, to throw the baseball harder, to make the ball move more. Like they're just a very data centered organization. And so there's some guys that can benefit a ton from that. JP Crawford last year was the poster child for driveline. If you follow driveline on Twitter, every fourth tweet I think is about JP Crawford. And you look, it's for As good it reason. Be. I mean, from 2020 to 2022, Crawford hit 17 home runs in 358 games. And then last year hit 19 home runs in 145 games. Added a few miles an hour of bat speed. The basic math on that is for every one mile an hour of bat speed you add, you add 1.2 miles of exit velocity, which translates to another seven feet on fly balls. So you add three miles an hour of bat speed. That's an extra 21 feet that you're getting on a fly ball right there. Uh, it, it makes a difference. And you look at a guy like Ty France who had a little bit of a down year coming off of a couple of good years. He was kind of he hurt goes to drive line and he, reportedly 
he's added three miles an hour of bat speed this off season. That's a big deal. A guy who's been a 17, 20 home run type of guy. I think we could see 25 home runs out of him, which would make him a more productive offensive first baseman than the league average. We add Mitch Garver to the team. The Mariners cut payroll, but I don't think they necessarily cut talent this year. No. Yeah. So I think with Polanco and Garver, that's two yep. veterans in the lineup that are probably going to hitch. I mean, yeah, probably going to slug around 450. And if they can do that and get on base at like a 325 clip or whatever, they're going to be all right. I, I think I also think that Mitch Hanniger had a down year kind of in San Francisco last year. I think he's going to have a probably yep. a bounce back season in Seattle. He really likes playing in Seattle. Dominic Calzone is a Canzone is another guy that has shown a lot of flashes of excellence this spring and last uh, last year. So um, a lot, there's just a lot of things to be excited about with this uh, Seattle team. And as far as the driveline thing, I laugh at that, but it, it needs to be said because not everybody goes to driveline. It's not like yeah. every single person goes there. So at least you have an idea of, okay, I'm not saying literally write a list, but in your head, okay, okay, that person went to driveline. Let's take a look at him for a couple of weeks and see what it is. Because I can tell you right now from a props perspective, JP Crawford over one and a half hits, runs, and RBI was a bet for me every single day he played. And yep. I'm not kidding. And that is not an exaggeration. If you watch my live shows or anything like that, you know that JP Crawford, Ty Fran, I'm sorry, JP Crawford, Hassan Kim, and Jake Fraley were the hit runs and RBI kings. So, yep. no, it makes a ton of sense, man. It makes a ton of sense. Um, and there's others. There's Cressy and Tread. Like it's not just. It's not like Driveline is the only company out there that's helping these guys. Right. But no, yeah, Driveline's got a really strong track record, and it's it's notable when guys go and. They can add some bat speed or add some velo because those things play at the major league level, which is why JP Crawford made you so much money last year. So, mm -hmm. but what about the Rangers? We can't we we can't get out of here without touching on the rainy World Series champions. They obviously have a lot of injuries going into this year. They don't have Scherzer until probably the All Star break. Tyler Malley till the All Star break. Degrom may or may not pitch this year. Nate Lowe's on the IL to start the season. Seager just started taking swings last week, and now he's. It sounds like he's going to be in the opening day lineup, but might not be. There's a there's just a a lot of missing bodies from this team, for lack of a a more nuanced uh, phrase or, or way to say that. They're really shorthanded going into the season, coming off of a long playoff run. What do we expect? Their win totals at over or under 88 wins. I'm way under that. I have them at like 80, 82 wins max. Um, I, again, this isn't not that I have anything against the Rangers. I'm just not liking really what I'm seeing from a, a overview of this team. Obviously Seager and Simeon at the top of that lineup. Fantastic. Uh, they went from 68 wins last or a couple of years ago to 90 in a season. That was really awesome. They won a world series, all that stuff. But the fact of the matter is they're in a, in as far as a franchise that RSN to be, deal that they have to deal with, they're still dealing with that. So they're really limited their ability to get free agents and all that stuff. Not to mention you talked about the pitching. I mean, can they can they hold weight to get all the way there with John Gray, Dane Dunning, Andrew Heaney, and stuff like that? Like it's just really those things that's really hard. And then you, you're going to be asking a whole bunch of young guys to do a whole bunch of work, like the the guys like Wyatt Langford and Josh Young and Jonah Heim um, and Evan Carter. I mean, it, it, do I think that they're all going to be good baseball players? Yes, but at the same time, they're so very young that I can see them going in different types of slumps. Do I think that a guy like Jared Walsh hitting eighth in that lineup would be really good for them, who's a former All Star? Yeah. But at the same time, too, then if you go look at, like, let's just say the bullpen, for instance, LeKirk, David Robinson, Schwarbs, Yates, like none of those guys, like I don't even think that they pitched that well last year. I think they got, they pitched decent in the postseason. I think their bats just what carried them. Like, I, it's just really hard for me to go up and down this lineup and be like, or up and down this roster and be like, man, yeah, there's a lot of things to like here. I mean, do they have some big names? Yeah. But at the same time, if you take away the, that they're World Series champions and if you just take a look at this roster as a whole, it just really doesn't do much for me. This might be our other di disagreement beyond Toronto. Like, if there's two teams where I think we have the most separation between our expectations going into this year, I think it's probably Toronto and Texas. I actually like Texas to probably win 90 ish games. Part of it has to do with the fact that last year they, they had the third worst record in one run games of any team in baseball, which again is more of a luck metric than anything else. The pitching is a huge concern to start the year. I think John Gray is just adequate with really no room to go up and not a whole lot of room to go down. I think he's just going to be a league average pitcher. Uh, Eovaldi, it really just depends on the velo. 
when the velo's up, he's an ace. When the velo's down, I mean, he's he's an automatic fade from a betting perspective, and you, you really don't love to see him as a fan out on the mound for your team when when the velo is down. The back end of that rotation is problematic with with Dunny and, and, and Bradford to, to to begin the year, but if they if they can tread water with the offense until the All Star break, I I do think they're going to have some they they have a lot of expected regression in terms of their win percentage and one run games from last season. That's definitely a bonus. And then you still got bats. You still got Adolis Garcia. You still have Seager's going to get healthy, and we've seen him play in, through injuries successfully before. I'm not super big on guys like like Joss Young, but I, I love, love Garcia. I think Leo Di Tavares took a huge step forward last season with the bat. The team has the best defense in, in baseball as well. Was last year, probably will be again. I think as long as you have an elite defense, you're going to give yourself a chance. And if you have lukewarm pitching, but you have a really good defense, maybe you can experience some good luck with with uh, balls on play as long as you can keep the ball in the park. So for me, this is a team, they just need to tread water. They need to be 41 and 41 after 82 games. If they can do that, I think they have a chance to win 89 or 90, but they, they really need to just figure out how are they going to survive until they, they get some of this pitching back. I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. Somebody knocked on my door. Like this is no, like, the good. worst possible first day ever. Like this is ridiculous. It's all good. We're, we're, we're living and learning. It, Absolutely it ridiculous. I haven't had somebody but, knock on my door in three weeks. I swear to God. <laughs> like it's unbelievable. No, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, no, I was just saying that the, the Rangers, I, we both got them third. You, you got a lot of reasons to be cautious with them. And I think I agree with all of those reasons. I think, for me, I'm just trusting the offense. I'm trusting the defense to to help them tread water until they get Scherzer and uh, and Malley and, and potentially Degrom back. And I think it's also notable they were the second team in on C's, so the Padres got Dylan C's. the The Rangers had the most competitive offer, from what I've read, other than the Padres. So to me, that's a team that is still willing to spend. That's a team that, if the pitching is a major red flag early in the season, I would not be surprised if they went out and tried to upgrade. In some shape or form, if the, I think that if the, like if the Guardians got off to a really bad start, Bieber being in a contract year, I think Texas would probably be at the top of the list for Shane Bieber services. Yeah, I'd be really quick. Like uh, I know they have Lighter as a prospect as well. I, I'm not I'm not like super well versed in the Rangers pitching prospects, but I'd be curious to see if they have anything really great coming up. Uh, just because a lot of their guys that they would, you know what I'm saying, are position players. So, uh, yeah, just one of those things I'd like to look at as well. So Kumar Rocker is the other guy I was looking, that name I was looking yeah. for. Rocker and Lighter are the two guys that are coming up. But Rocker only pitched in AAA last year, so he probably has another year or two before he gets to the big leagues. But Yeah, yeah and those guys have scuffled a little bit during their yeah. minor league career. But, but they're still better than the Angels. <laughs> we both have fourth in this division. <laughs> Yes. What do you want to highlight from this? What 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 do, what do people need to know about the Angels aside from we? I mean, we we know Otani's gone. We know this team is perpetually underperformed, even with some of the best players in the league the last couple of years. What do they need to know from a, a fan perspective, from a betting perspective, heading into twenty twenty four? Um, I think that like I one thing I just want to say that like the youth of this team is going to be where it's at. Like I understand that you have like Mike Trout and Aunt, nobody really cares about Anthony Rendon at this point, but the, the younger guys on this roster is what's going to make you want to go to the ballpark every day and watch this team on TV. Uh, rather it be, uh, I, I consider Taylor Ward still kind of young. He's only been around for three years, but Taylor Ward, another one of those guys that not a lot of people know of, but is a really very solid baseball player. Nolan Shamel, I, I'm sure I butchered that last name, um, but he's going to be playing first for them. And he he was just drafted by this team um, in 2023. So the fact that he's going to be, he's their, like their number one prospect. So he's going to be playing first base on an everyday basis. So you have him at first, Logan Ohapi as a catcher, um, and then Zach Neto at shortstop. I mean, both of all these guys are very, very young in the 22, 23 draft class. So that's again, probably not the best as far as winning baseball games on a daily basis over the course of 162. But looking as a whole at this team, you can see where they're definitely things to build. Um, as far as the pitching staff goes, not really fantastic. I would say that Griffin Canning and Reed Detmers are decent. I mean, they're both first and second round talents. I actually think Detmers is a little bit better, but Griffin Canning has performed a little bit better. Both of those guys are still over a four ERA or whatever, but I think Reed Detmers, if he has like a decent year, 
uh, can give you like 175 to 180 innings and maybe 200 strikeouts. I, I truly believe that. Um, and then Tyler Anderson, a decent lefty arm to round it out. But the bullpen is where it's just bad. I mean, Estevez, Moore, Soriano, Garcia, Simber, um, they're terrible. It's one of the worst bullpens. Stevenson's hurt to start yeah. the year. Yeah, like, like the big yeah. reliever addition, not even healthy to start the season. I was just about to say, the, yeah, the one guy that they were, were supposed to even make it that was uh, you can trust because he came from the Rays is now hurt, um, yeah. or at least started from the Rays. But yeah, anyway, it's just really hard to get behind this team as far as on a day to day basis over 162. I would love for guys like Joe Adele to finally show up, who's been a triple A all star at every point in in his career but anytime he comes up to the major leagues just doesn't really show out like i would love for that so if you start to see guys like joe adell come up and play well maybe that's a good sign for the future but as far as this year it's just really hard to like anything is with this angels team i completely agree i i think i'm maybe a little bit higher on griff canning than than detmers but i think they're both they both have potential canning has yeah. just not been able to stay healthy yeah, i think i think detmers looked really good for a long portion of the year last year and i think he just got fatigued late in the season but but Griff, Griff Canning at the end of last year was actually really good. You can see after the All-Star break last year, uh, 391 ERA, 326 FIP, did a good job limiting traffic on the bases. One of those really high skill sets where he can strike guys out, he limits the walks. If that uptick in velo that we saw towards the end of last season, if that sticks, very solid guy. He just, again, has had a lot of difficulty staying healthy, staying on the field. How much of that has to do with an organization that is a little bit more backwards than frontwards? You know, I, th I think that's a fair question. Uh, Reed Detmers, I like him. Probably, I I, th I think 175, 180 innings is a fair estimate for him, especially after last season. 28 yeah. starts last year, allowed three earned runs or fewer 20 times. Like that's a guy who's going to give you a chance to win day Thank in and you. day out. Yeah, and, and that's and right there is that's and sorry to interrupt you, but that's oh, all good. I wanted to point out is these guys will give them an opportunity to win a baseball game. I'm not saying they're going to win them because they'll probably get let down, but opportunity wise, it's there with Canning and Detmers. Yep. No, I hundred percent agree. Uh, I think those two guys far and away, the, the best options that they have in the starting rotation, the bullpen is going to be a disaster class. Again, the defense is going to be a disaster class. Again, like those are two really, really sore spots of the roster. Mike Trout, I, I will say, like for people again, people who haven't done their their drafts yet, Mike Trout. I know everybody looks at him in, in that like seventy five to one hundred average draft position range, and like, oh, we have to draft Mike Trout. There's reasons to not draft Mike Trout, like both from a health perspective and from a baseball perspective. He's still he's still capable of being a top ten player in baseball when he's healthy, but the zone contact rates have plummeted since his peak. He's not he's not the same elite hitter that he once was i mean he's definitely in like that top tier or two but he's no longer like on that list of aaron judge mookie Betts, ronald acuna jordan alvarez when you're talking about the best hitters in baseball i think he's definitely in a tier two below those guys bat speed's still pretty good but he started to to strike out a lot more showing some more weaknesses against breaking balls some of those things tend to get a lot worse pretty quickly mike trout's smart enough and has a high enough baseball IQ where I think he's probably going to be able to to curb his his age related decline somewhat as long as he's healthy. But he's not he's not a cornerstone the same way I think a lot of people still view him. I do like Taylor Ward. The big thing for me with these young guys, usually when guys have young players on their team, there's reasons to be optimistic. But in contrast to what you said about you trusting the Astros organization, I don't trust the Angels at all. And I think the fact that you rushed, rushed up a guy like like Nolan, who you drafted last July, and then you were in panic mode trying to save the, the season with Otani, you put him at the top of the order, That that's just tough. Like, the guy just hasn't had enough time to develop. Neto was in that same draft class with Jackson Holiday, and we know he's not better than Jackson Holiday, but he still beat him to the big leagues. Ben Joyce got up there. Uh, he had the injury, so we never really saw how that played out. But they have a, a track record of rushing guys to the big leagues and it not working out. So I think this time of year, it's very easy for everybody to say, well, look at all the things that could go right. But I think we've done a pretty good job on this show and in our conversations. Well, what could go wrong? Well, they have a lot of guys on this team that have very, very minimal minor league experience who could be vastly exposed at the MLB level. I think Logan O'Hoppy is probably the, the young player that I'm most excited about, the catcher, yep. some defensive issues. But he should rake, especially against lefties when he's in there. Like I think if you're looking for – Toast is big on systems plays. Like he's going to find one guy and just ride it. I think anytime you see Logan O'Happy against a lefty, 
over one and a half total bases, or if you want to get more aggressive, like three plus something like that, he should rake. I, I like him a lot, but this, this team as a whole, I think is just very, very flawed. I think it's more likely you see them flirting with the worst record in baseball than it is. You see them fighting for a playoff spot. hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And, and just going back to just organ like organizations, like the, I'm not trying to make this a conversation of what they should have done with Otani, but it, the fact that they never ended up trading him at all and got absolutely nothing for that is just an abomination. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to say that they should have gotten whatever. I'm just saying, like, the fact that they couldn't take a step back from making money and being like, man, this is going to help our organization for the next five years if we get these six prospects. Yeah. Because imagine what you could get for Shohei Otani. I mean, look at what the, I mean, look at what all these tr- guys are going for. I mean, even the cease trade. I mean, yeah. if they would have gotten Drew Thorpe, I mean, how, I mean, that's a, a and very, that would have been very, the bare minimum. They would have gotten exactly. 10 exactly. Like, That's like the one guy. Yeah. And then you're going to get five others too. It's just, it just boggles my mind. It just doesn't even make any sense. I agree. They're just really flawed decision-making because not only do they not trade him. Okay. We're not going to trade him. That's our decision. But then you go all in on guys like Giolito. And I think there was it Ronaldo Lopez. They brought over, like you give away some really decent prospects for guys who you kept for no time at all, you, then you put Renfro and Giolito and, and Lopez on waivers after a week or two, or was it three weeks that maybe they were with the team? Yeah, it was so, just a... So you trade really quality prospects for guys who then you gave away for nothing. And then, and then you still... There was credible reports that the Angels still had a chance to match the Dodgers' offer, and they let Otani walk. Like, if you, if you really wanted to keep Otani, if you're really all in on Otani, which is respectable if that's your decision... You cannot let him walk. If he's if he was truly willing to stay, which again, there's a lot of credible reports that he really did give the Angels the opportunity to match that offer. Yeah. How do you let Otani walk after trading all those prospects? They have the worst farm system in baseball. I don't even think it's close. They have the worst farm system because they didn't trade him. Right. And then on top of that, they've protected Otani too. Keep in mind, they're the ones that gave Otani the opportunity yep. to play as a two-way player and all this stuff. So Otani had every reason possible to stay in LA. He was happy. He didn't have to yep. talk to the media. They would protect him. There's all these things that he could do on a daily basis that they would let him get away with, which was some of the reasons why people didn't think it might not work out as far as like certain things with the Dodgers. But yeah. The fact that they didn't even do anything with him and got nothing is just absolutely insane. And then, like you said, made it even worse by trying to make terrible trades, gutting your farm system. It's like being on the MLB on the show and making a team bad and being like, ah, whatever, and then pushing the power off button. Except yep. for now we have to watch this freaking team. Yep. Could not agree more. Well, you th- So any chance Oakland is better than the Angels this year? I know we both have them last in our in our projections, but any chance Oakland ends up with a better record than the Angels? Man, I don't want to say it's that crazy. I, no, I, I don't think it's that crazy. I, I wouldn't say no. I would say it's not that crazy. I think it's a coin flip chance. Absolutely. I mean, we can talk about Oakland right now if we want, but I yeah. I mean, I think their season win total is way too low. <laughs> I, I, I Again, not trying to make a case that the Oakland Athletics are some barn-burning baseball team, but they are way, way better uh, than people make them out to be. Um So, yeah, um, as far as Oakland goes, yeah, I do have them last in my division. Um, But BetMGM had them at 57 and a half wins um, at their season win total. Um, That's just absolutely ridiculous to me. Um, I I have this team anywhere from 65 to 70 wins. Um, Not that, like I said, again, that's not a a good baseball season. But when you're talking about gambling and season win totals, it's different. Um, I I do think that let's just start with the rotation because I do want to talk about pitching. They're four. Isn't as bad as you might think it is. Alex Wood, Ross Stripling, J.P. Sears, Paul Blackburn. Alex Wood, Ross Stripling, both veteran free agents, both been in Major League Baseball for seven plus years. Again, they're going to give you an ERA around four, four, three, whatever. Again, not fantastic, but as far as in this context, pretty not as bad as you might think. J.P. Sears, one of those guys that um, was a Yankee before, um, I, I was originally from Seattle. Um, again, another one of those guys where I think he's like middle of the pack. Four, two and a half, four point two ERA or whatever can get get yourself some strike. I mean, a pretty decent strikeout rate for uh, JP Sears as well. And then Paul Blackburn, another guy that's been on Oakland for a long time now. Um, that I mean, again, nothing special, but it's not really that bad. The bullpen is it again 
in this context, not bad. Mason Miller, um, Danny Jimenez, Austin Adams, Kyle Mueller. I mean, these guys aren't terrible. That Mason Miller kid is actually pretty damn good. That Lucas Iraq kid, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name either, uh, but he's actually pretty decent too. Um, and then if you take a look at the lineup, is with the Oakland lineup. I mean, Ryan Noda, he's a rule, a Dodger rule five guy that, I mean, truly, I think they can hit 20 to 25 home runs. The average isn't going to be there, but he can slug. Um, Zach Giloff, another one of the stars of Oakland, I guess you could say he's probably like the, him and Brett Rooker are the probably two main guys in this, um, that would people who would know. Um, and they're not terrible. And yeah, it's, Gelf, they just uh, signed JD Davis. However it is, it's not terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Seth Brown, JD Davis, another two guys, another veteran got a couple of veterans guys, JJ Blade, not really there with him, but Shane Langoliers is, I think is a lot better than people think. I think that he can hit like a two fit, maybe two fifty ish, something like that. And if he can slug, you know, four thirty, four fifty, um, and the six, seventh hole for them, I, I mean, that could be pretty decent SD Ruiz. I mean, as long as he can get on base, he can steal you 60 bags. Yeah. Um, Abraham Toro is another guy that can play anywhere in the infield for them. He speaks three languages. He played on the Canadian national team. Um, there's just a lot of little things that sh you can find yourself liking when you're up against the context of Oakland is the worst team that you can fade them every game. If you're trying to get away from that narrative and find little ways of value, they're definitely there. So I, I would, if their season win total is under 60 in your book, I would definitely take it for the over because you don't have to worry. Like if, like for me in the Astros, like if the Astros lose five games in a row and they have a two ba a bad two week stretch, I'm going to be sweating that out. But with this Oakland, as long as I'm winning one, two games a week, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm just slow and steady, baby. Just get me to that 60, 65 wins and I'm good to go. Yeah. You could have a horrible season and still end up with 60 wins. And, and I think last year, I mean, for as bad as Oakland was last year, they went 25 and 45 to end the season, which is a 58 win pace. I grabbed them at over 56 and a half. You grabbed them over 57 and a half. If they just replicate that, if they don't, if they don't get better at all, they wanted a 58 win pace in the second half of the season. And one other thing I wanted to point out too, last year, we all know how terrible they were. There was like a two, three month stretch where the Oakland A's were hitting at like a 75% hit on the run line. So they were losing a lot of games, but they were losing a ton of one run games. Uh, so it just goes back to, I, were they, were they bad? Yes. Were they as bad as maybe everybody made them out to be? Probably not. Yeah, and I think when you talk about regression too, especially in the context of a futures market, we talked about the Blue Jays and how they had four guys make the vast majority of their starts last year. And in an optimal world, you would have, like in an optimal world, you would only use five starters all season. It's impossible because guys are going to get hurt. You're going to need to build in some maintenance for some of these young guys and you're going to have guys come up, whatever's going to happen. Some guys will underperform. But in an ideal world, you can see JP Sears started 32 games last year. You would have five guys started 32 games that would be ideal for a team last year Sears was the only one that started more than 22 for Oakland and this year you mentioned Alex Wood Ross Stripling they're not sexy but they're they're pretty reliable in terms of staying healthy they're pretty reliable in terms of when they go out there they're not going to get completely obliterated on a regular basis they pitch in a really really pitcher friendly ballpark in Oakland which is going to help you know, if, like if that's your true weakness of the roster, not to say the offense is great, but the pitching is definitely, I think, more of a vulnerability. When you're pitching in a pitcher-friendly park, that certainly helps things. But you should have more stability from guys like Sears, from uh, from Stripling, from Wood. And I think just from a pure regression standpoint, so last year, J.P. Sears, you can see, led the team with five wins. That was the, the fewest wins to lead a team since 1899. <laughs> So they just cannot be that bad again. I, I, I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to find out if, if, you know, like if, if I lose my money on, on over 56 and a half wins, I'm fine with it. I just don't believe in teams being able to be that bad consistently. And I was talking to a, another buddy of mine and about the A's and I said, they remind me of a thrift store, like a thrift store vibe team where. No, uh, there's reasons that other people didn't want these guys. There's reasons that you don't want Langoliers. There's reasons that you don't want Brent Rooker. There's reasons that you don't want Stripling and Wood and some of these other guys. But it's still pretty functional to a degree. You're not wearing, you know, Chanel. You're not wearing, you know, all these like designer brands or, you know, n brand new Nikes and Adidas and things like that. But they have good, they have guys who can platoon. They, they have guys that can hit just righties. They have guys who can hit just lefties. They'll play 
decent enough defense. They have guys like Ruiz who can steal bases. Mason Miller should help the bullpen a lot. I think the bullpen should be improved just by sheer virtue of having more stability in the rotation. No bullpen in baseball threw more innings than Oakland last year. And we know how overuse is directly correlated to, to teams' performance in terms of run prevention. This team, 56 and a half wins is just too low. Like, I, I'm just, they could lose 100 games and you still win if you take the over in that situation. So I'm, I'm not bullish on Oakland, but I think I'm more bullish than the market, which I think is fair to say for both. Well, you're, bull- you're bullish on them because of what their season win total is right. set at. So, I mean, that's what it is. They also have, like, of their top 15 prospects, they have three guys that they could throw into that bullpen that are probably major league ready. Uh, with Joey Estes, uh, Joe Boyle is another guy. Uh, and then uh, they have uh, Luis Morales. Like, or no, Mason Miller. There's some other guy. Oh, uh, Steven Avechia or Avechiara or something like that. But regardless – they have guys that um, that are up and coming as well. I don't think you're going to see that Vecchiara guy anytime soon. But yeah. my point is, is that there's guys coming up from Oakland as well. So uh, there's just there is positives. It's not all negative, doom and gloom as everybody likes to make it out to be. That's all I'm trying to say. Yep. No, I agree, man. I agree. I agree. Well, so to recap, we got we both have the Rays winning the American League East. We both have the Twins winning the American League Central. We're split in the AL West. You have Houston, I have Seattle, but we both have them in the top two. Before we get out of here, from a betting perspective, a- a- anything that sticks out to you in terms of the futures market, like if you had to give people one one bet that, that they want to take away, they want to have something to follow throughout the year, what would that be? Um, I don't have his actual number right here, but I think Kyle Tucker over his RBIs, um, over uh, essentially Kyle Tucker, I want to talk about, but his RBIs as well. Um, you can rather to lead the league in RBIs is 2,500. Um, but I just think that this is like a going off year, uh, for Kyle Tucker. Um, he's first and foremost, when I look about these season long is do these guys play games? Um, and in over the last couple of years, he's played, uh, 50 or, uh, in 2020, he played 58 out of the 60, and then he's played 140 plus games the last from 2021 on, um, and two of those seasons with 150 games. So, um, you're, he's going to have multiple guys in front of him in that lineup that are going to be able to get on base, uh, which I think is going to be absolutely huge for him on top of the fact, um, well, I'll just say the guys, Altuve, Alvarez, Bregman, all those guys are in front of him. Uh, he he hit 284 last year, but he was actually his expecting a bad average was closer to almost 300. Um, he's he strikes out less than 13 percent of the time, or just over 13 percent of the time. I expect that to go down. I mean, he's hit 29 home runs in his last three seasons. Um, he I mean, he just absolutely smokes the ball. Um, he's in a perfect spot in the lineup with all these guys who have heavy OBPs in front of him. Um, I, I just he, he knows how to hit in Houston. Um, you know that they're going to be in. The, you know they're going to be in it. And they're going to be a good baseball team. They're going to be scoring runs. So um, he finished third last year in RB, RBIs. I just think that this year he's going to be a major spot up. So plus twenty five hundred to lead or to lead Major League Baseball in RBIs or whatever his number is now um, in just RBIs as a, in the season would be over for me as well. I think Kyle Tucker has a lot of stakes this year. Yeah, I completely agree. I actually, I bet a little bit of Kyle Tucker to win the American League MVP. If you look oh. at the last. Okay. Three, we're on the same page, Toast. Pablo okay. Lopez, we're both rolling the same way. Now we're the same way on Tucker. And I it just came down. I was doing some research. And you look since the beginning of 21, there's 10 guys. Like the, if you just look at the te- top 10 hitters in baseball by uh, like park adjusted metrics, offensive metrics, what you see is Tucker's eighth in home runs, seventh in steals, eighth in WRC plus, doesn't strike out a lot. You can see here his XW, like his, his weighted on base, his expected weighted on base, which is the most predictive metric from year to year, doesn't have any vulnerabilities against velocity. He can hit off speed pitches. He can hit breaking pitches. There's really no weakness here. When you look at the other 10 guys that are on this list since 2021, all of them have either won an MVP or been in that conversation for an MVP at some point in their career. J Rod, very young just finished top four in MVP voting. Tatis was right there as a finalist a couple years ago. We know Betts and Acuna were one and two last year. Betts has won an award. Harper's won an award. Soto's been right there. Trout's won a few. Judge hit 62 home runs and won an MVP. Alvarez is a DH, but is unquestionably one of the best hitters in baseball. And if there's ever going to be a DH 
to win MVP, it's going to be Jordan Alvarez. So I, I love Kyle Tucker, man. I, I, I think that's a great bet. I'm a little, I don't love betting RBI props personally, but it's just a, like more of a personal thing. Like, I think we all have our markets that we, that we focus on. Like, I know you're more of a hitter prop guy. I'm more of a pitcher prop guy. Right. So it's not to talk you out of an RBI thing. It's just like, as you guys get right. to know us throughout the course of a season, you'll, you'll see me more on, on the pitcher stuff, but I love Kyle Tucker, man. I, I think it's, uh, I think he's going to have a great season for me. The one bet that I would give people with for, for a future on a hitter would be Spencer Torkelson over 28 and a half home runs. The guy last year made steady progress across the board against all three pitch types. He's starting to come into his own former, former top prospect, a lot of draft pedigree. Detroit's starting to figure some things out. There's some better hitters in that lineup now. So he's going to start to see some better pitches. 28 and a half home runs for a guy that homered at a 45 home run pace the last two months of the season. Another spot where I'm willing to find out. You know what I mean? And a guy that's going to should get about 660 plate appearances yep. this year. So for sure, for sure. So, well, any good news? So th- that we can share with anybody before we get out of here? Um, no, no, I don't have anything particularly. But I just wanted to talk about like this podcast. We we want to do this is like a segment. It's kind of like a feel good story of the week or whatever. Uh, what prompted this is like major um i can't remember who got the hit but mookie bets um they had they the guy threw the ball into the stands he ended up throwing it back to mookie so mookie could get the guy whoever it was his first uh major league uh hit his ball back right and then the next inning mookie bets comes back out with one of mookie bets's bats and gives it to the guy um in the stands um and i just wanted to just to show that because it's just like one of those feel good moments in baseball. Um, and this is a baseball centric podcast. And we just want to talk about obviously the betting side, but also the feel good sides about it. Um, and what make people want to go to the games and stuff like that. So we're going to have people come on and talk about them. We're going to have hopefully major league players come in and share. we got a couple of things trying to line up. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything as far as this week. I think Kamish, do you have one for this week? I'm just happy for Estevan Florio. I, I'm, I think it's a success story for him. He was blocked in New York. He's always, he, he was a top 40 prospect at one point. He's got some swing and miss issues, but fresh start in Cleveland with Tito, not being, being the manager anymore. And uh Miles straw is gone. Like, like Florial is going to have a chance to actually get some at bats here in April and, and maybe make a name for himself in Cleveland. I think it's good for the Cleveland fans too. I love Tito. I think everybody pretty much universally loved Tito as a manager, but if he did have his his flaws, it was the fact that he was very, very loyal to veterans, probably to a fault. And yep. Miles Straw was one of those guys that he kept sending out there every single day to a fault. So to have some some new blood in there, I think I think will be good. I think for a, a young manager who's still in his 30s to be able to grow alongside guys like Florial, guys like uh the Rokios and you know the, the entire pitching staff outside of Bieber for Cleveland, these young guys. I think that's just gonna be a feel-good team to watch this year. No one's going to be really scared of them, so they're not going to be hated by anybody. And it's just going to be kind of fun to see these young guys, especially if you know if they start winning some late inning games in in exciting fashion and things like that. So that's my feel good story. I'm happy for Floreal, the guy who's I feels like he's been knocking on the door forever, and no one's given him a shot. I'm excited to see what he does with it. Yeah. And and I just wanted to say the reason that we wanted to do this is just because it's just baseball. I think there's a lot more to it as far as going to the park with your family and catching balls and stuff. There's just a lot of things to it. And we're just trying to grow the game and show you how good of a game that this game can be to everybody and how awesome it can be. So if you want to share with us and in the comments or on Twitter or anything, something that you saw that happening and stuff, but um, it's just easy to talk about, you know, Otani and the gambling and, um, and, and, regional sports networks and stuff being a mess, but there's also a lot of really cool things that go on on a day-to-day basis in baseball. And that's what we want to talk about. So I just wanted to say that that's all I wanted to say. For sure. For sure. Well, I appreciate you guys. This will be fun. Uh, At some point we're going to graduate to doing this live or like Toast said at the top, we're going to do the national league here in the next couple of days before opening day. And then after that, it's going to be once a week. We're definitely open. We're going to have a segment, you know, answering your questions. So, you know, you know where to find both of us on Twitter at commission film room for me. Uh, it's, it's at toast Sam's 13, I believe mm-hmm. for, for yep. toast. So, you know, where to find us on Twitter, DM us, get us in the replies on, on YouTube here or on Twitter with your questions. Like toast said, if you have feel good stories, uh, we're definitely going to be more than happy to share that kind of stuff, but really just looking forward to talking baseball, man. Like you, Kyle's got a great daily show he's going to do for baseball. If you're in it strictly from a a betting perspective, 
If you want to learn a little bit more about the game, if you just want to talk baseball, listen to some baseball, this video has run a little bit long. The NL probably will as well for the mm -hmm. season preview content, but probably about an hour. I would say on a weekly basis during the season, and we're just going to come hang out, have a good time, keep you guys updated on what you need to know about the league, and do our best to to make the to make this season fun. I think at the end of the day, that's the most important part. Whether you're, whether you're betting, watching it as a fan, or whatever else, I think no matter what, you got to find enjoyment in the sport. Yeah, and I just think I also think that what I like about us is that we also look at the game a little bit differently, and so we're going to get two different perspectives. You're going to go kind of deep into the analytics, and I'm I'm not so deep, but I watch a lot, a lot of baseball. So um, I, I just think that it's a we can really do well playing off of each other. I think that I think everybody is going to benefit from that. So um, I'm sure everybody's going to be able to have their little fun with whoever wins and who doesn't win in one of our little arguments that will be really fun to go back and forth <laughs> with so <laughs> can't wait you got a head start on me toast because you got the audience on your side they know you uh <laughs> yeah sometimes but they also audience likes to talk their <laughs> crap too so they might just be on your side just because yeah. <laughs> well we'll see i'm looking forward I'm, to it i guarantee you every single atlanta brave side is going to click your side no matter what so. <laughs> <laughs> well we'll see i'm not super high on the braves either but that's next video you got to come check yeah. us out again and We'll talk about the Braves and more, but appreciate you guys until next time. Check out all the other content on the channel as well. If you want all of my stuff, I have a sub stack. A lot of it's free as well. Toast uh, is in the VIP with Kyle and, and with Beaver as well. Just ask us. We got content all over the place. A lot of it's free. A lot of it's accessible, available. We really exactly. just want to give you guys really high quality information. So appreciate you tuning in. If you have any ideas, any feedback for the show, we're, we're just going to be learning as we go. Until next time, we'll see you guys. Have a good night, guys.